Is the, is the volume okay? All right. Hello, everybody. We're ready to begin. Good evening, and uh, welcome to the new faces here. I'm Victoria Vesna, chair of the Department of Design, Media, Arts, and I'm very pleased to see such a mixed crowd and a lot of new faces here. And we have an amazing couple of people tonight, um, Peter Pierce and his daughter, Celia. <laughs> Some of you who do know me know that I have been obsessing on Buckminster Fuller, and it was part of my PhD thesis to think about Fuller and some of the structures in nature and um, in relation to networks. And I had the privilege to meet Allegra Fuller, who is in the audience here, and you can please give her a hand. <laughs> she gave me access, full access, to the Buckminster Fuller archives, which were in Santa Barbara, and that's where I was based at the time. And that's where I came across Peter Pierce's books and his works and was digging through them before I knew Celia, actually. And by accident, we found out that, wait, that's your father? <laughs> so, so suddenly, this kind of wonderful trajectory from structures in nature to interactive art to culture and social and architectural explorations all came together. And to have you both here tonight is a wonderful pleasure and a great honor. So a very quick introduction. I have a huge three-page bio, and I, I won't read it, of course, but I, I will read a little bit. Um, Peter John Pierce is the principal of Pierce Research and Design, a consulting service which offers advanced concepts for the design and for the built environment. He holds nine patents, has authored a very famous book, Structure and Nature is a Strategy for Design, Polyhedra Primer, and Experiments in Form, along with various other acclaimed articles. He is considered the leader in the field and is known to be a lover of jazz. <laughs> Please welcome Peter Pierce. by all this technology. Can you hear me? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Um, let's see, I'm still bothered by this light, this backlight. Can we, can we do something about that? Okay. More. <laughs> it's, it's reflecting off of this. Uh, yeah, that's better. Okay. Um, good evening. <laughs> How are you? Good. Okay. Um, the, the, this, is, uh, this lecture that I'm going to give, I don't know whether I'd even call it a lecture, is an experiment because it's not one I've ever given before. Um, and so this is, you're, you're kind of guinea pigs tonight. Um, the title of it was 50 Years of High Performance Design, and I felt first I had a I have an obligation, I think, to tell you what I meant by that, or wh where that comes from. Um, I'm not quite as old as that title suggests, although I'm pretty close. Um, <laughs> but the notion was, uh, I, I, when I got to my age, I said, well, how did I get here? You know, what is my, why do I think the way I do? What, what, are, my, what are the origins and the roots of my sensibilities? Because, as a matter of fact, that, whoa. As a matter of fact, uh, what was that? Is, that? is that NASA doing something or what? Spontaneous reactions. <laughs> um, 
What was I saying? What, what, what was this lecture about? Um, anyway, the, the question that, that became interesting was, as I said, what, what are the origins of my sensibilities and ideas? At this point in my life, I feel very strongly about those sensibilities and work hard to mobilize them. So I thought it might be interesting to understand wh where they came from and how far back do I have to go to understand them and so on. So the, 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 the notion that I'm obsessed with is what I call high performance design. And what I mean by that is uh, high performance design to me is when form, three dimensional form if you will, is, is the agent of performance. It has to do with efficient, energy efficient. You know, I'm sitting here thinking, why can't I read my notes? I realize that I can't read it without my glasses on, right? I, and the problem is I can't see you with them on, so let's see if I can make this work. Um, anyway, efficient use of materials and energy, um, that's a simplistic uh, interpretation of what I mean by high performance design, but primarily it's form as an agent of performance. That's a fairly subtle idea, I think, as, as this presentation unfolds, maybe you'll appreciate that. But in any event, um, what I was interested in as a child, or what I was compelled by, was three-dimensional form. I was curious about it and was attracted to it. And it was about 1950, when I was 14, that I began to understand that my interest in it had to do with how things perform, and particularly high performance uh, objects that required performance. And my, my archetypes for High performance design were basically airplanes, cars, and bicycles. And, um, and, and I'll get into that in a little bit here. Um, the other thing that I became very obsessed with uh, was, the, was the notion of innovation, that I, somewhere along the line, I sort of uh, embraced the idea that it wasn't interesting, life wasn't interesting unless you did something original. If it had already been done, to do it again was a fairly boring thing to do. So the idea was to, you know, try to, to uh, in, in Edison's words, I guess, find a better way to, to do it. And uh, this, this really kind of emerged as almost a moral imperative. I felt morally obligated to try to, you know, sort of stretch the envelope, to go out on the edge a little bit. And uh, it didn't occur to me, of course, especially when I was younger, that, can you hear me okay? didn't occur to me that that might be a risky thing to do. And I just sort of bolted forward and said, you know, I'm going to embrace the unprecedented. What the hell? That looks like fun to me. Uh, I didn't realize, you know, it took me many, many years to realize that that was a treacherous kind of thing to try to do. And I paid some fairly high prices for doing it, but I'm still here and I'm reasonably healthy. So that that's kind of the general introduction. The Let's see if I can get this thing to work now. This is, this is uh, we call these slides that I'm showing. And they, it's transparent film, and a light goes through it, and it'll magically put an image up there. So let's see if it works. Uh -huh, aha, OK. But what I do have is this neat high-tech pointer, which is a laser. This is a schematic drawing of the house I grew up in, in Geneva, New York. It, it was actually built in 1941, and my mother referred to it as a salt box house. This is in upstate New York. Now, in 1941, I was four and a half years old, and my mother, before I ever saw this house, we lived in a rented duplex or something, and my mother said, we're building this house, and it has a round door. And you see the round door. And I, and I thought to myself, what the hell does she mean by this? I said, a round door, first of all, you can't put hinges on a round door. Not easily, at least not any hinges that I'd ever seen when I was four and a half. Secondly, I didn't know how you got through a round door without tripping over it. And I, I, this really troubled me. I mean, I pondered this. And it was many weeks before I ever actually saw the house. So one day, I finally got to see this house. I'm still on a learning curve with this device here. Really. Anyway, I finally saw the house, and what she meant by a round door was this, this device. And I said, Mother, that's not a round door. That's a rectangle with a round top. And I can see 
I can see where the hinges go, and you know that makes perfect. I see how I can walk through it without tripping. I mean, it's cool. You know, I, I thought that was fine. And so, uh, interestingly enough, I, th I thought about this um, later, and thought that maybe th the other thing about this, even though this is not the round. First of all, when she said round, what that meant to me was a circle. I was already a rigorous morphologist when I was four and a half. I mean, round is a circle. A circle has a constant radius, right? It, it doesn't have lumps or flat sides or anything. It's round, man. That's a circle. This is not a circle. This is some other kind of form which is, has bilateral symmetry. A circle has an infinite number of symmetry planes, right? Anyway, the other thing that I thought about was even though this isn't a round door, it was a different door than anybody else in the neighborhood had. Everybody else had rectangular doors. So I'm thinking that even though it wasn't a round door, it was a different door, and that this gave me a per permission. This is probably where I got the idea that it was more interesting to do innovative things or try to do innovative things than to do things the way they were done in the past. So that was, I think that was a, probably a pretty profound experience. And there was a second experience, uh, it's a little more abstract. This is a, at that same time during this construction process, this is a cross section of my bedroom. I had a brother, so there are two beds, and they had, my parents had seen in a magazine that it would be very cool, there's a small house, small rooms, that if we could hang the beds on the wall and then fold them up, then during the day there would be all this room to play in. So this was a schematic drawing. This is the lower bed with, with the leg that would fold, and it's folding up. This is the upper bed. Now, I was up in the room there watching these guys put these beds in. Again, I'm still four and a half. Maybe I'm 4.6 by then, I don't know. And I'm looking at this thing, I'm looking at this thing, I'm looking at this thing, and I said, this bed is not going to fold up. It's going to hit the ceiling, right? And so, and I, I had enough sense of propriety that I didn't tell the workman that. I figured that, that wasn't a wise thing to do. I went, ran downstairs, and I said, Dad, Dad, I think we got a problem upstairs. And I explained this to him, and sure enough, they never put this bed in. They put it on this side, and then it was, the beds were so close together you couldn't do anything, and the beds weighed 300 pounds, so I don't know who the hell was going to fold them up into the wall anyway. <laughs> so subsequently, my father took the two beds and made, disassembled the whole thing and built a bunk bed, so one was over the other. So that was another kind of early, early experience. Um, Now, during, in 1941, we were, you know, in, into the Second World War, and I'm now getting a little bit older, and, uh, you know, the war was, I, I'm, I'm a, I'm kind of a paradox because I'm basically a dove. I hate war and I hate violence, and, but I love airplanes. And so I used to study these fighter planes in the Second World War, and I could name all of them and that sort of thing. And I believe that that these airplanes are really at the root of everything I understand and perceive about how design, how to take place. And if you look at these airplanes, uh, just from a pure form point of view, I mean, look at the elliptical wing on the Spitfire. These are both Spitfire, the Mustang, of course, there. The thing that struck me was that not only are they incredibly interesting, um, and I think quite beautiful as pure form, um, they're all different. And there was a constant array of new airplanes during that period. And I was just very curious about why they were, how they could all be different. These all have their own attributes. And they really represent, um, in my view, a, a perfect integration of form, structure, engineering, materials, and, and, and process. And that became kind of the, the, the prototype of all design for me. And then later, that, that, that's, you know, 40, 1943, 44, 45. And later, s circa 1950, uh, the war's over and the Europeans are getting back into automobile racing and we're, we're, we're having these amazing vehicles, which to me were, were the analog to the airplanes. They have this, you know, they're, they're absolutely incredibly focused purpose-built devices that 
in which the form is driven by aerodynamics, minimum weight, uh, you know, the, the packaging of the whole project. But again, you have these amazing sculptural, this is a D-type Jag, a C-type Jag, this is a Porsche Spider and a Maserati. Not only that, as this thing unfolded, if you took the skin off, you find this is the, the chassis of the C-type Jag. This is 1951. This was the first time I had any awareness of high strength of weight triangulated structures right there in the C-type Jag. Wow, that's real. I never saw that in my 38 Ford that my dad had or any other American car. And then this is a 300 SL about 1953, uh, the chassis. And this is another view of the C-type Jag. Those were, again, um, just, you know, to me, it wasn't just how did it look. It was a, this, this kind of bigger picture and it was evolving. Um, and of course, had I been born rich, which I wasn't, I came from humble origin, I would be a dead race car driver today because I absolutely wanted to race cars. And the car I wanted to race was this car here, which is a 1957 Porsche Speedster. I finally did that about 12 years ago. This is me racing at, at Laguna Seca in um, Monterey in the historic car races, and I won the race. I'm actually quite good at this. And I, I bought the car and restored it, managed the restoration. But it was interesting because it's, it's like, okay, here's this design and it has these kinds of qualities um, and, uh, and so forth. But by actually having the car and driving it and driving it in this context, you, you begin to appreciate that in 1955 or whatever, this was a very advanced and very successful design. So it enhances the appreciation of the, of the design of these things. Um, the other, the under, other underlying theme, um, it, is the sound working all right? I, it, it, it does funny things when I wander around, but if you can, I have to move out here because I, I, in order to, if I, Susie's gonna start yelling at me if I take too long here. The other uh, theme underlying this kind of high performance design thing and this notion of of form as an agent of performance and the integration of form structure, materials, process, all of that is the idea of innovation. And, and I became absolutely obsessed with jazz music. And one of the reasons that I did, besides, besides having an affinity, one has to have an affinity for these things, right? Was from about 1945 to 1955, between Charlie Parker and John Coltrane, there was this unbelievable level of innovative, creative work. And it was, it was far more inspiring to me than anything happening in design or designers with the possible exception of a few people you'll learn about in a few minutes. But, uh, and I was uh, fortunate enough to, to witness this firsthand. I used to, in the mid fifties, I would go to all the jazz clubs and I'd hear, this is John Coltrane. This is a slide I took actually at the Zebra Lounge in Central and Manchester in, in about 1960. But I heard Miles Davis and Coltrane and Sonny Rollins and Thelonious Monk and Charles Mingus and I never heard Charlie Parker. He died three weeks before he was supposed to come to a concert that I could have gone to. But in any event, that was, that was a very important thing. And it's, uh, if you've seen the, the Ken Burns show, it's, it's, an, it's an amazing legacy. Um, the other aspect of this that you might predict is I also was infatuated by the instruments and I view the saxophone as another sort of um, strain of the airplanes and the race cars. I mean, I see this as, high, as pure high performance design. This thing is, was designed in 1840 by Adolf Sachs. It was the first uh, wind instrument invented from scratch. It was the first wind instrument to have, to be acoustically perfected. And it has a, the notion of the acoustics, just briefly, is that it, the, when, when, if you listen to a, a Baroque, a Bach orchestral suites or something played by a, 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 a vintage or a, what do they call, you know, a, a period instrument, it always sounds out of tune. It's partly because the instruments are so primitive. And what happens with, with a saxophone is that the, 
if you put the tone, if you have a flute with just holes in it, you can't put the tone holes, you can't optimize their location acoustically and still reach them with your fingers. You have to move them around a little bit, adjust them, and then so you lose the pitch. This has this remote key work, so you can put the hole in exactly the right place, and then the finger can be somewhere else where it needs to be ergonomically. So it becomes a high ergonomic uh, you know, solution. The other thing is the, cur the shape of the saxophone is for ergonomics. If you, if you couldn't, if you look at the family, uh, the one on, this is a sopranino, soprano, alto, tenor, a C melody, tenor, a baritone, uh, bass and contrabass. These two you can play as straight horns like a clarinet. You can reach the keys and it's fairly reasonable. If that was straightened out to look like this, you'd need a gantry crane to, to, to hold it up and you'd need all kinds of devices. So. The, the curvature is really about ergonomics. It's not about acoustics. Um, the other thing that's interesting about this, which relates to some things I'm going to talk about in structure later, is here you have two counterposed principles. One is a, a, a phenomenon that is true regardless of scale, namely the acoustics. These have exactly the same fingering, even though there's this huge range and scale difference. So. The acoustics is scale independent, right? It can be big or small. The ergonomics cannot be scale independent. Why is that? It's because they're played by people who are not scale independent. They're fixed in scale within some narrow window of size. So that, I, I think that's very interesting. The bottom line is I think they're beautiful, as are all musical instruments. Uh, and if you look at them carefully, and I won't spend the time, you'll find that most musical instruments are driven by a lot of other things than you might think, including ergonomics, which is a very big, if you can't play it, you can't play it, right? I mean, you can't get a sound out of it. Once again, uh, being obsessed with this music for all these years, when I was in my 40s, I finally decided, look, I've got to learn how to play this. I've got to learn how to play bebop. Um, and I fooled around, but I never really got serious. I started taking lessons, and I studied, and I learned. I said, I want to be by the time I'm 50, I want to be able to play all the things you are with a real bebop band. And I did, I did get to that. I had a little band for a while. I never really, I've, I've played in public, but not in any kind of organized way, just jam sessions. But uh, again, it gave me, doing that, participating in that, and I still play, gave me two things. It gave me a very deep understanding of the instrument as an object of design, which I wouldn't have had without playing it. And it gave me a profound, deeper understanding of the music and so uh, that that was a that's a very happy part of my life and it also was a great I, I should have mentioned this on, on the race car thing too that was when I was doing that I had a company with 150 employees and it was it was a nightmare most of the time uh, trying to pay that you know four hundred thousand dollars a month overhead and stuff um, and so the racing was part of my stress management program it was kind of what I call a kinetic Zen experience because you would get in the car and if you if you thought about anything else but keeping that car on the road and getting around the race course in the most efficient trajectory, you wouldn't be on the race course. You'd be somewhere else, upside down, probably in the dirt. So it was it was a very powerful debriefing kind of experience. Similarly, playing the saxophone has a similar effect. That's not why you think you're doing it, but when you finally do it, that's what kind of unfolds. Now, um, skipping ahead, I, I went, went off to college uh, in uh, 19, when did I go, 1954, and was still obsessed with cars. And so I, although I wasn't in a, in a design school, I went to the Institute of Design in Chicago, you couldn't design cars, or it wasn't part of the program. So I did them kind of interstitially, I did them off, offline. And one of the first ones I worked on was a, a redesign of the Volkswagen Beetle, which you're all familiar with. And this was my first published work. This was in Road and Track in 1958. And this was, I was published with three other designers. The other, I didn't put them in the slide, the other cars that were designed looked like they came out of Detroit. They were uh, typically Detroit excess, you know, oversized, overweight, overwrought. And so this was an attempt to up the performance of the, of the VW Beetle from the standpoint of reducing the aerodynamic resistance, increasing the room inside, increasing the luggage, improving the visibility, blah, blah, blah. This car, I, I think that this car would not look out of place on the, on the road today. 
and again, this, this was 1956 when I designed it. Similarly, I worked on some other sedans. These were bigger sedans uh, with rear engines. There, there was another magazine competition that never I never submitted to, but it gave the specs, and it was a, a, a real engine that was being developed by uh, one of the air, airplane engine companies. And so that was, again, trying to deal with the packaging and the it's a rational approach. And again, if you know what cars looked like in 1957, and then in, in 1956, I also was still thinking I wanted to be involved with race cars, so I designed this competition car, sports racing car, and it really anticipates um, aerodynamic principles that became widespread 10 years later in the mid-60s in European and even American sports car racing basically an upside down and backwards wing that gives low drag but high downforce and nobody even really talked about that in those days. I didn't have access to a wind tunnel so it's a it's a hypothesis but it, it turns out if you look at later cars you'll find that they look pretty much like this. I was also fooling around with so-called monocoque stress skin type structures using composite materials in those days fiberglass. I never really built any prototypes or anything but and then I also did a a uh, designed a truck, which was uh, used that used the same that four cylinder V8. It was a V4 air cooled engine sitting up here, and then with a long in internal access, very low bed, front wheel drive, independent rear suspension. So it had a whole series of attributes that were were represented a paradigm shift over existing trucks, uh, and of course. And again, these were all offline. I, I didn't do anything as part of school, but I did them. I did built this model in the, in the school shop. Why did I do them? Who the hell knows? I mean, it just seemed like it was an interesting thing to do. This, the, you can see that the passenger sitting one behind the other so that I could have this large area to, to put long objects like conduit or whatever. Um, now, the... the it occurs to me now, I mean, I, you know, in those days, as you might imagine, I was very much the purest. I still am, but I've learned a little bit in the meantime. But it didn't occur to me that, it wouldn't occur to me to, to ask anybody, would this sell? It seemed to me reasonable, and it addressed, it, it gave capabilities you can get from a normal truck. It also would get good gas mileage and stuff. Nobody cared about that in 1957, but... Um, but it occurred to me later, recently, I was looking at it again, I mean, this, this past year, I was looking at this, this. You could put this on the market today, it would look completely modern, but nobody would buy it. Why? Because it's not macho. And, and people buy trucks and SUVs, which is a very regressive kind of development because they're macho. And if you look, if you put a an SUV, typical SUV on, the, on a lift, you know, grease rack and look underneath it, it basically looks like a truck from about 1939. I mean, there's no fundamental sophistication to the design of those things. I mean, they're just uh, disgusting. I, I, I'm probably the only guy that you know who thinks that gasoline ought to be not $2, but $3 a gallon. <laughs> I just applaud when I see the price going up. I know these bastards are making a killing of oil companies, but the only thing Americans understand is if it hits their pocketbook. So if you have to pay more for electricity, you'll conserve, right? If you pay more for gasoline, you won't buy an SUV, you'll buy an Insight or whatever. So it seems to be the way the world works. I don't like to think that way, but... Now, okay, here I am. I'm this guy. I'm obsessed with cars. I want to race cars. I want to design cars. But I'm thinking nobody in their right mind in Detroit is going to hire me when I graduate from college because they won't understand what I'm interested in or my sensibilities. Nobody in Europe is going to hire me because they don't need anybody. They already got all the great designers and, they, and also it's a burgeoning economy and they don't have a lot of resources to spend on to indulge American designers. So when I was um, in my junior year, I think, we went on a field trip to the industry of design to the Merchandise Mart and went to the Herman Miller and Noel showrooms and suddenly I became aware of, the, of this furniture, Charles Eames. Um, whoops, that's not the one. Harold Saarinen and Harry Bertoy. These are the, this is the Eames fiberglass chair, the Eames plywood chairs with 
plywood base, plywood chairs with steel base. This is an aerosarinin fiberglass shell chair and a wire shell chair by Harry Pretoria. These are all like circa 1950, 53 in that, in that area. So these were pioneering, you know, um, kind of breakthrough kind of things. Charles Eames and Aerosan worked together in the late 40s, uh, late 30s in, at Cranbrook, and so there's a, some joint thinking going on here. But I'm looking at these things and I think, wow, this, is, this aligns with everything I believe. These things are, again, the integration of form, structure, material, process, and, and this is the first time that I ever saw anything that looked like it was shaped so somebody could sit in it reasonably. I mean, furniture has always, was always this either just very rectilinear or stuffed, the bejesus stuffed out of it. What does that mean? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, you know what I mean. So that, that, that became um, my new passion was, and then I saw six or eight months later, they came out with the aluminum group, which was an Eames design. And that did it. I decided then and there that I had to go work for Charles Eames. So that was my that was my next step. And in fact, well, in preparation for that, I then designed, I worked on a lounge chair out of plywood, which I built at the school. And this was my senior project. And it's a somewhat innovative plywood. It's a big plywood spring that hangs from the steel frame and with some neoprene straps that hold it all together. And it's it was, again, an attempt at the integration of form, structure, materials, process. It, it uh, you know, what you see is what you get. There's nothing hidden. It wasn't real comfortable. It needed, it needed about three or four more iterations, which I learned later is what you need to do when you design seating. But anyway, this got me the job at the Eames office. And these are the, some of the projects I've worked on. Eames tandem seating, which is still in production. I designed all the castings and developed the first prototypes. And this was called the Time Life Lobby Chair. It's now called the Executive Lounge Chair. It's still in the Herman Miller catalog. Again, I built this, designed the castings and detailed everything out and built the prototypes. Um, these, these, this was a wall-hung dormitory storage unit that I worked on while there. And this was a chair called the LaFonda chair, two different shells. I didn't do those alone, but I did design this segmented base, which is aluminum casting, and I developed this segmented table version. And I worked on uh, the sofa, which was a second generation. There's an earlier Eames sofa that's actually quite a bit more interesting than this one. But in any event, that was, um, that was heaven working there. And uh, you know, I could go on for a long, a great length about that. However, uh, after being there for three years, I was kind of an impetuous youth and was trying to figure out who I was and what I wanted to do. And I, um, trying to remember what the next slide is. Well, I, le I basically left the Eames office after three years and I went to work teaching for the first time at Cal State Northridge. And um, while there, I developed some other furniture. This was a fiberglass, all fiberglass lounge chair system with an ottoman that was trying to make it as simple as possible, using the form of the material to create comfort and using compliant materials. Um, this was the disassembly. There's two molded pieces of a, a sort of compliant membrane that spans the seat that all is held together with four screws and these are snap-on. This was Velcro. First time Velcro had just been invented. When I did the plywood chair at school, Velcro had not been invented yet. So this was a, this was a great breakthrough. And then I also did a sofa, which was with some early experiments with um, framework structures. Again, these are all driven by this sensibility of high performance design, but a big concern for the ergonomics, the comfort of the chair and seating. Um, now, what happened during this period is I, first of all, I never sold any of this. I, I think the fiberglass chair, lounge chair, was premature in terms of the, uh, 
the market and the willingness for anybody to invest the tooling that would be required to do a big mo big moldings like that. Maybe 10 years after, later, it would have been feasible. But the other thing is people didn't like it. I mean, some people liked it, but designers didn't like it because it was too weird looking. Um, but And then the same with the sofa. I never really, I needed to do another iteration. I didn't do that. I started to get interested then in building system design. And this is, this was maybe the biggest mistake in my life. <laughs> if, if I would have stayed in furniture design, I'd probably be incredibly, unbelievably wealthy right now. But that's not the case. So the, the first awareness of a notion of, of a building structure, a house, if you will, architecture made from sort of industrial components uh, was the Eames house, which you see here. Um, and it, you, you know, it departed from conventional, certainly housing with steel and glass and, and so forth. So that was very influential. I, I must say that, that when I was at school, the Institute of Design, Mies van der Rohe was still there upstairs, and I was in very, probably influenced by that as well. Those of you who are familiar with Mies van der Rohe architecture. This was, though, a little more uh, coherent to me because I could see all the parts of the Mies buildings. It was a little obscure to me. But then, uh, actually through Charles, I, I got familiar with the work of Conrad Voxman. Probably nobody's ever heard of him. Who, who here has heard of Conrad Voxman? Oh, wow. <laughs> um, Conrad Voxman was a very innovative pioneer. He, he, he came to this country in the late 30s with um, Gropius and was a pioneer, wrote a great book called The Turning Point of Building, published in the late 50s, or early 60s, out of print. But this was a hangar that he designed with his students at the Institute of Design in about 1948. And this was starting to look like, you know, high strength to weight, long, big spans, big open space, uh, standardized components. And the, the big deal with Conrad was the, the connection design. He just, that, that became one of his obsessions. Uh, Scott Perry. How you doing? <laughs> um, the um, the other, of course, major influence was Bucky Fuller, and this is the Climatron Dome in St. Louis, which I, I think is about 1953 or 54 somewhere in there. And um, the again, the, Conrad and, and Bucky to me were very compatible, and I'm not sure they always got along, but I think in the end they did. But um, you know, the issues of long span, uh, high strength to weight in the case of the, the dome, uh, minimizing surface to volume. But there was, a, there was a notion that really, I think Bucky more than anybody else really, to me anyway, made clear. And that was that there's a, there's a principle um, of structure that's scale independent. And it has to do with the shape or the, the configuration, what I like to call strength of geometry. And it has to do with not necessarily the dome per se, but more the, the triangulation of the structures and so forth. Um, and um, so there was scale independence. There was also material independence because Bucky had made domes out of aluminum, steel, plywood, bamboo, you know, you name it. And so he showed that there are certain prin transcendent principles. Most of engineering, and especially in building, is uh, driven by what's called strength of materials engineering. And I always felt that that was a second order problem. The first order is get the shape right, strength of geometry, if you will, which, which links right back to this notion of form as an agent of performance. Um, that led me then in 1965 to a grant fellowship where I spent, spent a year and a half or whatever it was researching, looking for some theoretical underpinnings for some ideas that kind of grew out of my interest in system building design. Um, it was a search for first principles, if you will. Um, and um, one of the um, things that you learn from nature, of course, is nature always follows patterns of least energy, what Bertrand Russell called the law of cosmic laziness. Um, so, and the other interesting, the other idea I was interested in is what I came to call minimum inventory, maximum diversity systems. If you have a kit of parts, can that kit of parts be combined in alternative ways to create diverse building forms so that the building form might adapt to, to site, to climate, to various things. And the snow crystal really is a kind of 
quintessential example of that. Every snowflake is different, yet they all have the same molecular structure. They interact with the environment. There's an internal force system, which is the molecular structure and its concomitant forces that act, and the environment, temperature, wind velocity, humidity, whatever. Uh, it's what Darcy Thompson, in a book called Growth and Form, called, uh, represented as form, as, is a diagram of forces, talking about biological formative processes. Um, how do you store the greatest amount of honey with the least amount of beeswax? The bees know how to do that. It just takes less effort, least energy, hexagons. Soap bubbles, um, again, surfaces, surface volume is minimized as a, a single bubble becomes many bubbles. They become faceted. If you join the centers of the bubbles or the centers of the hexagons, you get a triangulated arrangement, which also defines the densest packing of circles or spheres, which is characteristic of a lot of molecular structures, such as metal structures. Um, it also, the, the hexagonal form creates, becomes uh, reduced down to what's called a three-rate intersection, at least in the plane. So these are really all topologically equivalent to hexagons on average, uh, meeting at 120 degree angles, which is the base angle. And here you see it on a leaf structure. Um, if you have random dots and you want to join them with the most economical network, you see the three-rate intersection. These could be cities and you want to spend less money on road. That would be the solution. Um, then you get into the question of, well, uh, this is what I call weak weakness of geometry. Um, this, this building does not want to stand up. It wants to fall down. That's its normal natural state, right? And that's because if you build a cube with fixed corners, put a load on it, it wants to collapse in this kind of ugly, ungainly way, these nice S curves, which are called moment, moment loads. If you take that same, so this again is weakness of geometry. It's an it's a inefficient structure. If you take the same 12 members and hook them together with a pin joint, hingeable joint, uh, you get a simple arc as a failure mode, which means it's only loaded axially, and it turns out it takes twice as much load to collapse that structure. So they call, the cube and the octahedron, this is, cost the same amount of money in terms of energy and resources, but the octahedron does twice as much work. So that's, that's a fairly interesting piece of information, right? So then the question comes up, what about, if we're going to talk about system building and creating architecture, what about the fundamental, the, the first principles of, of spatial subdivision and so forth? I probably shouldn't say this, but I think that, I believe that the, if you say what is the most fundamental definition of architecture, I, I believe that it is the differentiation of space. Architecture differenti differentiates dark from light, warm from cold, wet from dry, quiet from noisy. And, and if you look at indigenous building, that was what it was driven by. I want to keep warm, I want to keep dry, whatever. So then the question is, what, how, what, what are the rules? Are there any rules? What are the principles? So this is the platonic solids. There's five of them. If you can only have one kind of polygon, this is all you can build. But if you allow other types, you can do other things. This is repeating certain kinds of polyhedra to fill space, which begins to predict certain kinds of ways to subdivide. Uh, you can take those same patterns and treat them as networks. Some define closed cells, some don't. This is a diamond network. You can. This is an attempt to create a whole, put a whole class of spatial subdivisions in terms of networks and combine them in one structure, which I call the universal network. Develop a connector. So this is a, a kind of a non-mathematical, topological uh, or morphological way of dealing with it's dealing with it as a physical model system. Uh, you can take the networks that don't define cells and apply minimal surfaces, these curved surfaces, and actually close them and make other kinds of space filling systems. Something I invented, and in, this is all, this work was all done in 1965, 66. This is a saddle polyhedron. You can take the saddle polyhedrons and fill space in and leave out certain strategic, strategic faces and create something called an infinite periodic minimal surface, which is this, which is a tunnel labyrinth, which happens to be the, the map of a diamond molecule. And you'll see that later on a larger scale. But it has very interesting structural properties. Again, it's minimizing surface volume. So these are just looking at trying to understand. I mean, there's, there's a 
Well, as Victoria said, I wrote a book about this, so I can't possibly cover it but in this lecture. But if you're an insomniac, yeah, I'd recommend the book. Um, th this was a, an attempt then to take some of that information and hypothecate a building strategy. This is what I call a bubble building, and it's based on this. Lord Kelvin in the late 19th century had a hypothetical model of idealized soap bubbles, and that's using this shape, which is a truncated octahedron and a space filling array. And then I developed this geometry system, which I call the minim minimum inventory maximum diversity building system, minimax building system. And so this is extremely high strength to weight. It has high lateral stiffness, so it's strong resistance to wind and earthquakes. It's uh, low surface to volume and so forth. And then it becomes, in this case, the same system, a one-story, single-level school building with creating domes. These are not really spherical domes of different sizes. And then another approach, this is three strut lengths. And what I was fooling around with here was how unsymmetrical can I make a building with a simple standardized kit of parts? Thinking, OK, why do I want to do that? Well, because I might want to adapt to a site. I might, might want to adapt to prevailing winds or other aspects of climate or sun geometry, whatever function of the building. And then this is the cladding of that building. So this, this was trying to be weird without being irrational. <laughs> uh, and then all this stuff was documented in my book. And then I, there, the polyhedra primer is an attempt to make visible the fundamental aspects of this subject so that anybody who's not a mathematician can read it. And then the other book was a, a course in high performance design for college freshmen. This was a centerfold out of that, which is a, I won't try to explain it, but it's a what I call a minimax envelope. It's a shell over an arbitrary shape that then gets used to generate a whole series of other configurations. This is one structure in different views as you read down this way. And then this is an interpretation of it in the other direction. Um, now, at this point, the grants have run out. I'm broken. I need, I need a job, right? Now, who the hell is going to hire me to do this, keep doing this stuff? I mean, architects are not interested in it. Um, I don't know who is. So I ended up co-founding a, a company, another big mistake, with a partner to make, to, to develop toys, educational toys, if you will, that were based on these, on this stuff. So this was the universal network, the universal node. It's a shape-coded tinker toy. It's the ultimate tinker toy. This was a toy based on the curved space. That's Celia, by the way. So. Again, this is, this is now we're, not, we're, we're what, 1971 or 72, somewhere like that, where this is. And then we did a 3D net, uh, strategy game using net, a network called Net Results. And then this was a, a, a tiling game graphic, a two dimensional tiling game uh, based on uh, this idea of the minimum inventory, maximum diversity. Uh, the, the, the subtitle on the packaging was Discover Infinite Variation. What we discovered is nobody's interested in discovering infinite variation. <laughs> so nobody bought it, basically, but that's another story. And then these are two tiling games, color matching and pattern matching games we did. Then we said, we get, we're, we're not going to make it. We need to do something that somebody will buy. So we did a tetrahedral kite kit made out of plastic based on Alexander Graham Bell's tetrahedral kite, which was the first this is, again, circa 1903. Not, not me, but Alexander Graham Bell did the first really equilateral triangle space trusses, um, including using them for large kites. And so this, this was a, the first kite in a box that cost five bucks. Up to then, a kite was 89 cents or something. Then in the following year, I invented this modular kite called Skylynx that, again, was just an exercise in this minimum inventory, maximum diversity notion. And you could build a single kite. You could fly an endless chain of kites. You could make linear kind of longitudinal configurations or lateral configurations. These kites would actually, you could do loops with them with two strings. They were huge. They would make it look like a big biplane coming down. And you could, you could actually uh, crop dust with them or something. I'm kidding. They probably, you don't even know what crop dusting is probably, do you? Um, so anyway, that was. Uh, and then we, the theory was that we would start this toy company and make a lot of money 
and invested in larger scale stuff. It didn't quite work out that way, but it kind of did. So this was that curved space thing or that minimal surface thing blown up so that now it's an 8 billion times enlargement of a diamond molecule. So the kids are really electron scale as they zip through. And these are injection molded polycarbonate modules, pentagon, saddle pentagon, saddle hexagon, flat hexagon. It's a true shell structure. And you see the configurations. And we built quite a few of these. There's a huge one in Japan. It's a playground sometimes. It's a, an exhibit in a science museum. There's one in Oklahoma City at the Omniplex Science Museum. It's still there. It's been there for 20 years. This one is in Japan at a place called Hakone, which is a piece of it's a Peter Pierce's diamond sculpture there. So in Japan, I'm known as an artist instead of a mad inventor or whatever I am. So that was pretty exciting. And then we started looking at the triangulated polyhedra for playgrounds. Again, you didn't need a building, you didn't need building code approval, you didn't need any structural engineering, you could just empirically do this up in scale. This is actually in, that was in Aspen, this is in, um, Celia and I, Celia will tell you a funny story about this anecdote that happened when we were there, but it's in New York City, lower Manhattan, uh, surviving there, I guess. And then, then we got up in scale, this was the first kind of architectural scale thing, which was a trade show for Hitachi. This is McCormick Place in Chicago, which was their uh, consumer electronics stuff. So we designed all this stuff. And there was an, a theater inside there. And, but again, it, the, the issue was the technology that we were emerging. And that then suddenly came to life as uh, something I call the multi-hinge connection system, which was a fundamental paradigm shift over prior space frame or space truss connection systems that typically were central hubs that the members attach to. And I'm struggling with how do you solve this problem? And I'm, I'm way over time here, and I'm not even to this. Pardon me? Multi-hinge connection. Hinge, hinge, as in door hinge, you know, back to that round door problem. These are flanges that are flame cut and, or, and then welded to the ends of tubes in any combination. So you can make any geometry. And that was kind of a breakthrough at the time. Uh, square geometries, and then this shows them in context. Um, triangular square geometries, and then radial geometries. Um, and then integrating glazing. This is bisecting the structure with, so it was a very adaptive. This is outboard glazing. This is in Chicago. And then this was part of the biosphere, which is a detail of the glazing that was an airtight solution, and then integrating footings into the system, large scale. Those, all the prior structures were fairly small, like five, six foot long members. These are 10 and a half feet and five, six inch diameter members. Whoops, adapting the joint. And this is a dome joint. Uh, this is also a biosphere uh, inside the dome. Uh, I think that's the, we need the next tray. <laughs> Anybody still awake? How many configurations did you make on those flanges on the end of those? How many types of flanges? Yeah. Oh, it was endless. Was it really? Well, I mean, every project. Well, first of all, the learning curve. Suddenly, this got louder. Am I talking too loud? It, it, uh, every project. We did eight, about 80 projects in 15 years, and there was a learning curve. So you kept getting, having better ideas how to do it each time you did a new structure. And since it wasn't off the shelf, it was always, every project was done for a specific project. And since there was no tooling, it was flame cut. And eventually digitally flame cut, you'd just make a drawing or digitize it, and flame cutter would cut the thing. That was pretty cool. I thought I was Henry Ford for a few minutes. That was another mistake. but. This is, um, I'm going to run through these real quickly. This is Van Nuys State Office Building, which was an early concept for a climate, what I call a climate management canopy, where the, there's a structure hovering over a building which intercepts the radiant energy from the sun so that you create shade and reduce. I know her. Yes, <laughs> on um, integrating the shade panels and so forth. And so this, 
you'll see in a, in a while that this has become an important idea. This is Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, uh, which is a two-acre canopy supporting photovoltaic. This is, again, this is probably 1980. So this is like 20, more than 20 years ago. This is also a climate management canopy over a car park. So, it, you know, it gets, as you can imagine, very hot there. So it's nice to park your car in the shade so the tires don't melt. Uh, this is American Airlines corporate headquarters, again, circa 1980, uh, an entire building made with the structure. We, we did not do the glazing. I had evolved an entire manufacturing facility over time, as I said, where in the end we had, there's a, there's a number of wonderful people in the room here who actually worked for me in that company. Um, that uh, we, we had a vertically integrated manufacturing company, a la Henry Ford. We didn't make our own iron ore, or our own glass, the way Henry Ford did. But it was a it was a moment of glory. But this is a, another climate management canopy called Playground for All Children in Flushing Meadows in New York, which was intended to create shaded play spaces for children that were vulnerable to excess excessive amounts of sunlight for one reason or another. Uh, and these things are amazing because they. The panels heat up and then they create convection currents and they kind of self-cool. They're actually cooler than if you put an insulated roof integrating the panels again. Uh, this was a, this is in uh, Canoga Park, Fallbrook Mall, and it was an early, it's a food court integration of glazing. So all of these projects, none of them, they were all missed opportunities as far as, they were opportunities to, to explore uh, and to learn about how to build these high performance structures. But from an architectural perspective, they were always constrained by, by uh, parameters that did not, well, most architects that I worked with were not interested in things like sustainability or climate design or any of that stuff. It just was not, and for probably their clients weren't, certainly weren't either. But so it was, I'm hitting the wrong button maybe, yeah. Uh, so that was always very frustrating, but we, we kept pushing the envelope and learning more. And this is a British Columbia Pavilion, uh, which was a huge span. It's a 300-foot clear span on the diagonal with an 85-foot cantilever. And you work on these things with models, and, and I'm looking at the model and the computer model and the physical in, in our shop. Before I ever went to the site, I went to the site for the first time, and I looked at that space, and I said, Lord have mercy, what have I... <laughs> Is this thing going to really span 300 feet across that? It worked. Uh, radial structure. This is downtown Los Angeles. We did this with Jerry. This was, again, supposed to be a climate management canopy with growing things. So it was like a synthetic tree or a, an armature for a tree to create shade in this subterranean shopping center. This is at night. It goes down three levels, and there's you know stores and stuff. And you can see it here. You maybe there's planters in there that we designed, but it's starting to grow some things now. 20, 15 years later, where the biosphere, which was the grandest project, uh, about killed me. But it was a very exciting project. It's Eight million cubic feet of airtight enclosures, um, and uh, we're honored to have one of the biosurians in the audience here tonight, Roy Walford. Um, but it was, a, it was a fascinating and interesting, I think, uh, project. Uh, I'm just going to really have time to spend much time on it. These are the, the lung dome, so-called, which equalized the pressure against thermal gradients. Uh, but it was kind of a tour de force in terms of uh, the geometry. This is the wilderness biome, the agricultural intensive agriculture biome. This is the habitat, which was the kind of the residence and the offices and the labs. And these were the lung domes that maintain equal pressure. And it was completely integrated. You could change in terms of system integration. You could, my role was really this designing and building the structures and the airtight glazing. I didn't have anything to do with the environmental stuff. That was way too hard for anything I could think about. Um, and this is just a detail of the glazing, but it was, I was told that it was as airtight as a submarine. This is the uh, rainforest area, which I always love this photo because it almost looks like an ice cube. And then you look at it under different light and it's transparent. And I, I think the, the transforming and changing character of these structures is just absolutely wonderful. This is inside. 
But there were some very large spans, 180 foot spans of very small members is fairly innovative in that regard. And it has to do again with the strength of geometry, the configuration you can see. Oh, here's the dome, 180 foot dome. It's not a sphere, it's a, it's a flattened out sphere, uh, which has some very interesting attributes. This is the boneyard. There was about 8,000 struts that we made and shipped, designed a special rack. And then they're assembled in subsections and picked with crane and there's, there's lots of stories. The structure is so stable that you can assemble these big sub-assemblies without any scaffolding and they don't, they don't sag. You can see how controlled the shape is and there's nothing holding it up except itself. It's pretty exciting. Uh, this is the Arizona Highway shot. This is Detroit, uh, uh, Fallbrook, I uh, can't remember, Southland Gardens shopping. It's a winter garden in a shopping mall. Kind of an interesting configuration with an integral glazing. This is, this is after Biser, so the glazing system got more refined and simpler as we learned. Um, this is um, Universal City Walk. Some of you may have seen this. This is, a, again, not a spherical segment. It's a, it's a saucer-shaped structure, a radial geometry that, we, that I developed that has a, eight members meeting at the point and a high level of sta uh, member standardization. Um, and uh, let's see, we have actually, in, in addition to Roy, we have uh, Roger Conrad and Scott Perry, who were key players, and Karen Reeser, uh, and, and, and uh, who were key, key players involved in the Biosphere project, working for me at the time. They're in the audience. Um, and um, I think there's some stuff that Jim worked on too, probably in these slides. <laughs> this was uh, the second to the last project I did, uh, which is Navy Pier in Chicago. There's a winter garden here and a festival hall. Um, winter garden is an all glass enclosed inside the winter garden. You know, these winter, these northern climates, if you say winter garden, Everybody says cool, or they say warm, actually, because they go there in the wintertime, and it's a nice environment to be in. You know, it doesn't mean a lot down, down here, but um, there's a skating rink. And this is in inside the f festival hall, which is a trade show center. It's 250 feet across. I told the architects that I could do all this without any of these columns, and they, they wanted the columns. Go, go figure. I said it would be cheaper and easier to build without the columns because I can easily span the 250 feet. But this is outside. This And also, we're supposed to have much more daylight. This is on the roof, and then this is the roof on the roof, if that makes sense. And then this is um, uh, Fremont Street in Las Vegas, four city blocks long. It's a vault that spans in 200-foot increments off of these tree-like ca column capitals. It's 100 feet wide. Made a pedestrian mall out of, the, out of the old part of Las Vegas. It then is covered with a lattice work that becomes a climate management canopy. It lets air through but keeps most of the sun out. But then it's covered with 2 million light bulbs that are become a bitmap so that they can have animated show. This is a bison that flies, um, a flying bison that flies from one end to the other. They have a Wild West show. and. All kinds of goofy stuff with, and you stand under there and you see this amazing stuff. I didn't have anything to do with that. I just built the, the, the humble structure. Um, so uh, let me see where I'm at. Moving right along. What time did we actually start? Six on the no, we didn't. It was a long-winded introduction. Uh, you have to finish by eight a.m. No, no, no. I got to finish. I got to. We have to leave room for Celia, because she's a much better speaker than I am, for one thing. No question about that. OK, yeah, we're, we're, we're real close here. Um, now, after 15 years of doing this, for reasons I, I won't explain very much of, the company, which is Healthcare Structures, basically collapsed, primarily because there wasn't enough business. It's a long, ugly story, but that's all you need to know. So in, in 1995, roughly, I found myself unemployed, broke, in debt, 
all those wonderful things. And so I had to um, reinvent myself again. And so Susie, my wonderful wife, says, why don't you design something that people want? <laughs> <laughs> And uh, she says, design a chair. And I said, well, God, it's been you know, 35 years since I designed a chair. You know, and I would continue to be a student of seating. So I knew what was going on. And I was somewhat intimidated by what had transpired in the meantime. But uh, what the hell? <laughs> I can't tell you much about this. But I did, in fact, design a chair. And it's kind of a fairy tale story. There it is. And what the, what the chair is, what I did is I worked for about two years on and off on my own, financed by income tax refunds and my working wife and beating off creditors. And I built, built a working, what I call proof of principle prototype, which didn't look anything like this. It looked kind of like an electric chair. It looked like it came out of the skunk works at Lockheed, actually. It was all aluminum. It's actually quite beautiful, but long and short of it is I took that to Steelcase in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and sold it to him on the spot. And that was in uh, May of 1998. And uh, been working on it ever since. And it's going to be introduced in June next month at Neocon in Chicago, which is the big, um, what is it called? The, the contract furnishings trade show. And uh, it's, it's an interesting chair. It's very comfortable. It has, it's all made out of uh, high-tech, state-of-the-art injection molded glass reinforced plastics, nylon and polypropylene. It has a unique, oh, there to give you some idea of the scale. <laughs> um, comes as a desk chair and as a four-legged chair. It has a unique mechanism, which Displacing the dam, as you see here, which I call a balanced action scheme. It pivots, it has a, right there and right there, it has a little rubber spring, if you will, a torsional, very tiny. It's about the size of a silver dollar. And anybody of any size, weight, can sit in the chair without having to make any adjustments and do this reclining action. And you can actually rock in it like a rocking chair. And it has very sophisticated contouring of the seat and back, so it's very comfortable without any upholstery. The intent was to not have any upholstery. The four-legged chair is actually a stacking chair as well, and the arms fold up. Here's another view of the back side. These are the armed and armless four-legged chair. The, this chair, which is height adjustable, swivel, casters, the arms fold up on that too, does not um, come without arms. Here's how it stacks. You fold the arms up, and then you can stack it. Uh, we don't know whether it's probably eight or 10 on the floor and about 25 chairs in the, in the dolly where the thing is tilted. Different views of the chair. That's Anyway, there. it's also half the price, probably, of other high-performance chairs of this type. Very light, very efficient. Um, and then finally, the. Uh, The next project, which is not a new project, but it's going to get finished now, is a residence that we're going to build, Susie and I, on a piece of property that's at 2,200 feet above Malibu in the hills, which is what I call my eco house. And um, what it is is a, is a um, how can I describe this thing? It's a house. First of all, it's, it's predicated on the, the architectural paradigm is a barn, a one-room building, if you will, like a barn or a loft. But it happens to be uh, a very advanced technology. It's, it's a barn that's entirely glass, including the roof. It hangs off of a clear span space truss. The glass roof hangs off of that. It sits on a deck that sits on six piers that go 60 feet down to bedrock as it's sitting on an ancient landslide site. And then the space truss is filled with uh, louvers that control the sun. So in the, in the warm months, that's a view from the, north, from the south. This is a 
elevation from the south. You can see some schematic representation of the site adaptation. This is a section, and this is, you can see the shape of the inside. This is about 20 feet high at that point. And then there's a utility space underneath. Um, and then this is a elevation looking from the west. Um, you see the louvers. You don't see the, well, you can see the louvers in here. This, this is just a schematic drawing. Look, these are sections through the, through the site. Um, this shows the, the geometry of the louvers. This is June 21st, which is noon, at noon, highest sun angle of the summer solstice. And no solar radiation will actually touch the building envelope. And then in the, in, the, in the winter solstice at the lowest sun angle, you start to filter through some sun. The floor is precast concrete modules. This shows all the, the seasonal development. And it, this still is fine tuned. The louvers do not move. They're in fixed position. So, and then the, the building, all the windows open. The roof opens. The windows all the way around open. So, oops, sorry. So the whole idea is that this thing does not require, this is just a study in, in Form Z looking at how you, at different times of the day, you can set any latitude, season, time of the day, and look at where the shadows are being cast to verify that no sun is actually touching the solar, the, the enclosure. This is an open plan. There's, the only enclosed rooms are two bathrooms. There's a kitchen. There's a furniture system, which is a movable storage wall system that differentiates the other rooms, master bedroom, guest room, my office, Susie's office, living, dining, grand piano. Um, the deck, as I said, is uh, precast concrete triangular modules with a channel between each module where all of the uh, electrical schemes and networks and stuff are routed. This is a view of the roof with all the louvers, which are probably aluminum. This is just another view. This is from the east elevation. This is without, this is just the framework. Uh, this is just the louvers. Uh, this is part of it. You can see the, the glass envelope with some of the structure removed. Um, that's, what is that? It's another view. <laughs> um, the idea of this is really to, it, it's, um, I'm the, I'm the only one, Susie and I are the only ones involved. I'm the client, I'm the designer. Uh, I don't have to please anybody. I don't care whether you like it or not. It's basically taking everything that I think I've learned in 40 years or whatever it is of trying to do these things and putting it into that house. There's no off the shelf component. I have to design everything. I've designed a new joint to, to build this with. It doesn't use the multi hinge that I showed you earlier. There's a number of aspects of it, the whole glazing system will be designed from scratch. The openable windows will be designed from scratch. To me, that's like going to Disneyland, doing all that work every day. Fortunately, fortunately, I'll be able to do it because I'll have the time because of the chair royalties. Um, and it's, um, you know, it's, it's my crack at trying to address the issue of sustainability. Um, of course, we're, we're in a fire zone. We have a view of the whole Santa Monica Bay. We're in a fire zone, so there's no flammable materials. There's a whole landscaping aspect of this project uh, that, that is relating to the fire and to the understanding of the native uh, plants and, and so on. There's uh, seismic. This thing will never go down in an earthquake or any large wind, so we're interested in all those things. It's also, oddly enough, very economical. I know you probably don't believe me, but that's the case. So that's, that's pretty much the story. And finally, uh, this is Oliver. He's my main assistant. He keeps me awake and helps me sleep and whatever. So anyway, so is the, is the routine to have some questions now? You want to have some? OK. And I would 
also request if you would please use the microphone because we do have a pretty large online audience and they don't hear the question without the mic. Thank you. Peter, where did you first encounter uh, images of Bucky Fuller's work or his ideas? Oh, uh, gee, that's a good question. Did everybody hear the question? Um, you know, oddly enough, uh, when I was a student at the Institute of Design, which was from 1954 to 58, I hadn't heard of Bucky or Conrad Voxman, and they both taught there before I got there. Conrad was there, Bucky was there, I think, in 47 or 48, Allegra would know, and uh, Conrad was there just after that, and there was some detritus around the place of Conrad's. I saw some, remember seeing some photos, I don't remember seeing any of Bucky's stuff. Um, the first time was when I was working for Charles Eames, one of the projects I worked on was called Glimpses of the USA, which was a USIA or whatever it was called exposition in Moscow, which we call the Axe Moscow. And it was in uh, a Kaiser aluminum dome that Bucky, one of Bucky's domes, and that was the first time. And I stumbled across, at that point, a book called uh, The Maxine Roll of Bucky Mr. Full by Robert Marks. So that was, and I didn't understand a word of it when I first read it and kept struggling, but I liked what I saw and it somehow it made sense. So that was. Uh, did they did, were you influenced by jazz in terms of creativity? I was, the question I was going to ask, were you influenced more by jazz or Buckminster okay, Fuller? Okay, well, fine, yeah. So what, what was the question? Uh, how did jazz influence your creativity? How did it in inspire my creativity? Is that what you, yeah. Well, I, I found most designers incredibly boring. And uh, it's an interesting question. I really, my father played jazz piano. And there was a lot of, uh, he, he was, you know, he goes back to the late 20s. He had, he played sort of stride piano and stuff. It wasn't very good, but he could play by ear. And he, um, when I was a kid, I wanted to play um, the accordion. Go figure. <laughs> well, it sounds like a saxophone, right? Although I didn't, I hadn't tuned into saxophones yet. And so I, my father wasn't wealthy. He was a chemist, so he had, he, survived during the depression reasonably well, but he didn't have a lot of discretionary money. So he bought me this accordion and I wanted to play Lady of Sp Spain like Dick Contino. Do you know who that, anybody ever heard of Dick Contino? <laughs> Dick Contino kept winning the, what was it? it wasn't the horse height, it was some amateur hour thing on the radio. And he would go in and he'd just smoke on Lady of Spain. You know, he'd play this thing at this incredible warp speed. So, I got the, my father bought me the accordion. This is a long-winded answer to your question, but it is an answer. Well, it may not be an answer. We'll find out, won't we, when we get to the end of this. But it was a profound experience. I said, Dad, now that you bought me the accordion, can I have lessons? And he said to me, yes, you can have lessons after you learn how to play. And I thought about that for years after that. I said, what does he mean by this? If I knew how to play, why would I want to take lessons? And, but what he, what he was saying in essence was that nobody taught him how to play. I'm his son, he could hear everything. Why, why would I have to have somebody teach me how to play? Just play it, you know? And, and he, he was pretty good in that respect. And so that might have had some sub, subliminal undercurrent that, you know, it's like, okay, here you are, how do you deal with this? And, if you start playing notes, even if I could, I ended up teaching myself how to play ladies playing. If you're playing notes, there's nothing out there telling you what notes to play. It's a very risky kind of undertaking, right? And taking risks is at the core of creative activity, right? So, and I would go hear, um, you know, Clifford Brown, Max Roach Quintet in, at the Jazz Workshop in Chicago in 1955 or whatever it was, with Sonny Rollins, and I'd sit there and I'd they'd be playing stuff that not only I never heard before, nobody else ever heard before. They probably never even heard before. And every time you'd go to hear music in this time, all the way through maybe 65 or so, you would hear, I mean, it was, it's hard to explain, but it was, um, 
absolutely riveting to me. I mean, there, there was this intense commitment to moving forward, moving forward, playing new ideas. And I remember one time I went to, to uh, the Shrine Auditorium to a concert. This was 1959 about, and it was one of these jazz concerts which had something for everybody. So it was of good quality, but it had probably somebody like Sarah Vaughan singing, and there was some maybe um, the three sounds or some piano trio in the first part of the some more popular oriented jazz. Jazz was a very popular music at that time. And then on the second set was Miles Davis's sextet with Coltrane and Cannibal Adderley and uh, Bill Evans and and so on. And I'll never forget this as long as that. So I'm sitting there and this band starts playing and they get into a tune called Teo, which is now on a recording someday my prince will come recording. And Miles plays, and, and so Coltrane gets up and plays, and he's playing this solo. And it is absolutely riveting. I mean, this thing is unbelievable, what he's playing. And about halfway through it, I see half the audience get up and leave. And I'm thinking, what's wrong with these people? I mean, this is, this is a, uh, you know, it's, it's witnessing some profound, revelatory, transcending kind of Thing, you know, and to me that was way more interesting than looking at design design magazines. So it always it's it's kind of my church. I mean, I still I'm I'm a little bit frustrated now because I don't see the same. I mean, there's some wonderful stuff that goes on today, but it isn't at that level. It's more of a refinement than the level of innovation that I mean, you know, it was they were creating this whole vocabulary before my eyes. I mean, what a privilege to, to witness that. So that was. That has fueled my creative impulses ever since. I mean, you know, it's like lots of fuel from that. I, I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. Um, I had a question about, you had mentioned a lot of your buildings being designed with regards to climate and thinking about uh, maximizing energy resources. And it seems like there's so much of a need for that now, and there's so little of that being done. What are your thoughts in terms of is it just, you know, the public at large is very concerned and aware of environmental issues and energy crisis, and where is that not making, why, is, why are we not seeing tons of this stuff and all this yeah. material concerns? Well, the first thing I thought of was that we put the wrong guy in the White House. Um, second thing, second thing is that um, th this country is very spoiled. I mean, you know, I made the comment about the the price of gasoline and stuff, and uh, it, it just boggles my mind. I mean, I don't want to offend anybody, but. I mean, I, I, I view, if you look at, if you look at, um, I don't want to shortchange Celia. I guess I'm okay. Oh, okay. Uh, if you, um, God, I lost my thought. I've, thank you. The, the thought was this, that if you look, if you look, if you, a lot of you guys are probably high tech, you're in, you have websites and you're into computers and all this stuff. So you know about that, that near term history. If you look at most things in the 20th century that, were, that did not exist before the 20th century, and I'm mostly talking about technology, I'm talking about airplanes, cars, electronics, everything from humble stereos to refrigerators to the computer, they're all characterized by a thrust towards greater performance at less cost and less energy, right? I mean, think about your computer, just the history of it in this short period. For some reason, that sensibility is excluded from the building arts. And, and, and it's absolutely mind boggling. I mean, I, I, and if you, and, and I don't know why it is. First of all, if you go into part of it, and I, there's a couple of people in this audience who are good friends who are architects, so I'm not directing this at them. In fact, they're, they're very, very good architects. Um, uh, but if you, uh, part of it is the, the social protocol. 
This is not so much true in Europe. If you, if you read the European architecture manuals, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on there. And they're way, way ahead of us in general. And part of it is they have a different way of working. But the social protocol has everything compartmentalized. And so, and, and it starts at the top. The architect is the Christ figure in the process. I mean, if you're talking about big commercial buildings, you go into an architect's office and there's two drinking fountains. One says architect, the other says engineer. And the engineer comes in and he says, Yes, Massa, you want to defy gravity, I'll defy gravity. The, the engineer is not given permission to contribute to the form of a building. He's excluded from that process. He's a lower class citizen. And some of the great engineers of the country even say that. I've read essays by, I'm having brain fade, I can't think of the name, but there's a very well known engineer out of Columbia who's written a number of books who has written an essay to that. He doesn't say it critically, he thinks it's cool. But there's, a, there's some notable exceptions. Fosler Khan at SOM, who did the Sears Tower and the, particularly the Hancock Building in Chicago, is an engineer who said, put those diagonal braces and I'll save you half the steel and resist the high wind or whatever. But as a general rule, there is no, no true collaboration between engineering and architecture. As a sub-feature to that, um, it's funny, I don't, need to, I don't need any work now, so I can say anything I damn please, right? I used to go into architect's offices and, <laughs> Jesus, I better not. Um, the sub-theme is that engineers don't understand architecture, whatever that is, and architects don't, don't have a feel for engineering. And, and the thing that's absent is this thing I talked about earlier in high performance design, integration of form, structure, process, materials, function, I don't know what the ergonomic equivalent in buildings is, but there is one, and, and uh, climate response, adaptation. Uh, one of the most interesting architects I know is a guy named Ralph Knowles at USC. I don't know whether anybody ever heard of him, but he's done a lot of interesting studies on the response of climate and did a, some great books on called Energy and Form 20 years ago that talks about the, the environmental um, sophistication of the southwestern Indians, you know, whatever that was 2,000 years ago. Scott. Mike, Mike, hold. Um, there's somewhat of a paradox between um, the whole computer generation, the use of computer technology to right. generate these kinds of architectural and engineering kind of realities at the same time the amount of energy they use. And for, there are many reasons that you know, are contributing to this so-called energy crisis, but the use of energy has increased dramatically over the last 10 years, and the use of PCs and, and various kinds of uh, computer technologies have obviously increased the energy flux. And um, I'm just curious if you've looked at that in terms of ways of integrating your systems on your house for PVs, for instance, to kind of ameliorate the impact that, uh, you know, the use of computers to develop that geometry and that technology. Uh, there's kind of an interesting cybernetic relationship between computers and energy, and I just think that it would be an interesting exploration if you looked at a panelized system, for instance, trying to a panelized photovoltaic system for your house, or if you consider that option. Well, actually, uh, I didn't explain much about the house. The house is... Um it has kind of three lines of defense in terms of environmental control. In, in, the, in the hot weather, it's just totally naturally ventilated. The louvers, there's a stack effect naturally, and then the louvers heat up, and there's an acceleration through convection currents and pulling air through there. So um, it's, it's a, it doesn't require air conditioning. Um, in the winter, there's three lines of defense. There's, the first line of defense is the sun comes in and heats up the concrete floor, which is four inches thick or three inches thick, which is a thermal mass, so it stores the heat and then releases it at night. Second line of defense is there's a radiant heat system through the floor that's also solar hot water powered by an external solar collector. And then the third line of defense is cheating. There's a, in, in, the, in the radiant heating, uh, the uh, solar hot water radiant heating system, there's a, it's a, which is a closed system, there's a supplemental heater in the tank so that if you have 40 days and 40 nights of no sun, you can run the heater for a few minutes, but I mean that might run twice at two days out of the year or something. Regarding the photovoltaics, the the plan is one of my colleagues. You know Roger, right? 
You know, Roger's now become a, he has, he's, he's off the grid. He runs on photovoltaics, totally off the grid. Um, the, and he could tell you more about this than I can, but the, uh, there's some reasons not in a small building, not necessarily a, a tall, you know, a multi-story building. There's a number of reasons not to put the photo, not to integrate the photovoltaics in the skin of the building. Um, first of all, in, in my case, it would compromise the passive aspect, of, particularly the cooling side. My plan is to have photovoltaics, but as an off-site, off, not remote, remote, but just down the road, if you will, just in the neighborhood. Uh, um, and uh, but photovoltaics create direct current, which creates very large nasty uh, cabling and stuff. And so what you want to do is you want to convert that to AC current and de deposit it into batteries. So there's a whole sort of thing about keeping the batteries out of the house and not having the big cables. And so there's a whole bunch of issues there in small structures. In big structures, I think integration of photovoltaic in the cladding probably makes a lot of sense. But I, I don't see it as a I'm not saying you shouldn't do it in a house, but in a particular concept that I'm pursuing, I don't, I don't think it quite works. Yes, uh, Mike. Oh, sorry. Um, Take a number. We're very happy that um, you're here. I, I remember being in architecture school and having you come to SciArc and give a lecture. At which time, at the end, uh, uh, the structures in nature, a strategy for design, has been a was a phenomenal book for uh, us that got inspired in architecture school and I'm amazed that it still uh, stands on its own being still so innovative. Um, you saying that um, these were mistakes, is there, is there a book there that after the, the house <laughs> maybe there, would there shed some light the there to make up for this? Uh, well, uh, <laughs> well, I'm going to do a book. I'll, I'll answer the question. Um, I don't. I don't know about. Uh, I don't know about the. Well, I'll comment on the. I am. I have two. At least two books in mind. One is a is a case study book on this house. And that'll be the first book. And then I want to do some kind of a book, which is a combination of a sort of a autobiographical narrative, but more a history of high performance. I mean, there's another lecture I give in which I talk about indigenous building and I go all the way back to and cathedrals and all kinds of things that, and I haven't got that all sorted out in terms of, but I, I want to do, do that book as well, but I don't know when. That's not a high priority probably right now, but as far as a book on the mistakes or are those mistakes, you know, that's kind of tongue in cheek. I don't, I mean, yeah, you'll do it. That'd be cool. One learn. I mean, I guess the, the the thing about mistakes is you don't learn if you don't make them, right? right? And and I've made some very large mistakes and some very small mistakes. And the small mistakes usually don't hurt you. The big mistakes can hurt you pretty bad sometimes. And it, it was there was a moment there where my health was in jeopardy because of. I mean, not terminally, but it was a serious kind of thing. And. Uh, so, but I, I, you know, as I said, it goes back to the learning to play the accordion and the, and the round door that it, it, these things never occurred to me as risks. I mean, I just, just, just do it, man. This is cool. Let's do it. Roger can tell you, right? He used to, he used to call me the fearless leader, but I didn't, I didn't think it was that. I thought, I thought it would all work out, you know, but it, it didn't. I mean, I had lost a lot of money but fortunately I'm not, it's not um, going to matter but yes somebody uh, else had over it. here hi hi uh, well thank you for a wonderful presentation I really uh, I really enjoyed it oh, you're welcome. Um, th th there's a strong affinity that I feel with uh, specifically with those airplanes and the cars and all those things which I actually have found myself inspired by uh, a while back my background is in is in architecture, and actually, my, is first, isn't. my first teaching uh, job uh, was in industrial design, and I actually was teaching with uh, the polyhedra primer and oh, really? experiments in form. Wow! 
And uh, it's, it's really exciting to see you uh, speak. And <laughs> I'm always amazed to hear people, people call me and say they've read this book. Or, I mean, I just, it just blows my mind. Well, I, mean, I hadn't made the connection, so it's a, it's a really <laughs> wonderful surprise. Uh, one of the things that, that I do is use computers to design in, in various ways. And I want to go back to the dragonfly wing that you okay. had. Mm -hmm. And the comment that you made that it tended toward hexahedral structures. Uh -huh. uh, it tended. It wasn't strict about it. It was topologically hex hexahedral, but otherwise it varied. And I guess it's a question. It's also implicit in, in, in the, the way you uh, referred to people liking or not liking certain kinds of things. Yeah. I think we would all say that we, we like the wings of the dragonfly. Right. Uh, but if you tried to make a structure like the ones you've made I mean, with say, oh, that, get that insect. <laughs> if you try to make a structure like the one you've made with that degree of variety, you couldn't do it by hand. It would be maddening, I imagine, if every single member and every single joint were different. But with computers, you get to a point where you can have both the, the clarity of the topology and the, the, the structural principle, I think, and the degree of variation that nature as a strategy for design at the level of the wing of the dragonfly offers. And so I, I was wondering about that, about how you would, how, what your view is in terms of softening the structural principles that you've been using by computer. Uh -huh. um, that's a tough question. I mean, I, I don't, I guess my answer to that is that my own particular bias is that I, I, I never start with an image. When I design it, I never care what it looks like. I never start with, I want it to look this way or that way, or I never, never try to make it emulate a preconceived idea of what something might be. Um, because every time I've tried to do that, I put boundaries on the opportunities on the options because I've, cl I've suddenly closed the door. I'm saying, okay, this is it's like that, p that fiberglass chair I did in the 60s. You know, people, people thought it was ugly, you know, and I struggled with that. I went, I said, I'm going to do this. I have to learn something about this I, I do, because I don't want to be driven by temporal perceptions. I want to be, I want to get. I always look at my work as an attempt to understand first principles and to avoid c cosmetic resolutions. It's, I mean, you get into that, obviously, there's a, always a point on anything you design that you have moments of arbitration or arbitrariness, and you, I always try to look at it, how do I minimize the arbitrariness of this? I can't quantify every radius, every fillet, every whatever I'm trying to do, but I want to try to minimize the arbitrariness of it. Why? Because I want it to be sustainable. I want it to be sustainable physically, and I want it to be visually sustainable. I don't want it to be, I want my chair 20 years from now to be as, whatever it is, to be as appealing as it is today. I don't, and if I, and I, I feel strong about that if I, so I don't worry about that. I, and. Well, uh, let me, let me clarify. I don't mean it as a, as a cosmetic comment, and I don't mean it as a kind of fashionable comment, uh -huh. uh, but with all due respect, I do think that the dragonfly will outlive the chair as a well, design element. Anything, and, and anything so, in nature will. Right. So why but, is it, let me try to rephrase the question, why is it that the dragonfly doesn't have a perfectly uh, uh, uniform structure? Why is it that it has so much variation, and what can we learn from that? Well, the thing about that, is, what you have to look at is, you have to look at the hierarchies of the structures. If you go far enough down in scale. The reason the, the, the dragonfly wing is, is, has this random aspect to it, if you will, depends on how you look at it. First of all, it, it isn't random at all. If you look at it carefully, you'll find that it's, I mean, just to take that example, there's a, it grows in a sequence. You, you have these strong veins or the ribs and then they get subdivided. The ribs that are close together subdivide into rectangles because that's the most efficient way for it to do. The ribs that are further apart, the first line that comes off the rib is the nominal right angle to that rib, but all the others are at 120 degree angles. 
if you measure the angle, even though they're not regular hexagons, some are five-sided, some are eight-sided, if you take a tangent at that vertex, they're all 120 degrees. I mean, it's, the easiest way to see this is to make a two-dimensional froth of soap bubbles of random sizes, and you can find some will be four-sided, even three-sided, eight-sided. If you actually take a photograph of that and rigorously measure it, the, the edges are curved, but every tangent meets absolutely at 120 degrees. It's just, and it's because nature is so highly responsive so adaptive, the, the building system that it's using is at such a micro level in terms of the molecular structure that it can do all these things. It's, it's still made out of parts. Yeah. Everything uh, is made out, that wall is an illusion, that wall is not homogeneous. Of course, of course. Right? Uh, I, just just to, li to give away the, the microphone, but to put one word in the conversation, are, are you at all intrigued by nanotechnology? Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. But I don't see it having much relevance to my specific work. Um, yes, you need the mic. Oh, you want to No, there's a question there. Yeah, they're recording it. Uh, that was a great uh, building, your home. It oh, was you. wonderful. And uh, I, too, studied and graduated from architecture, from uh -huh. Berkeley, from Worcester Hall. And... Uh, I was always torn between architecture and art, architecture and art. So my decision was to do video and telecommunications. <laughs> but in, in that, one of the things that I continue to do is uh, network telecommunications. And now looking at a building like your home, how inspirational it is, and I'm sure it's wonderful and inspirational to be in there. But then you think, what about city planning? What about linking other places, making other homes like yours, other buildings that inspire people and awe them and make them think and network? And how have, have you thought about taking that kind of pod and making it uh, dis uh, distributed around so that it's a, a sitting planning place. So that's it. Um. <laughs> Are you asking, was that a question or just a comment? Yeah, you know, am I supposed to? Oh, that's okay. <laughs> The answer, maybe you have a better answer. I'm just no, I don't, I don't have out. an answer. I'm, I'm kind of. Um, trying to deal with things I know I can control. <laughs> right, right now. And so that's kind of where I'm at. So it's a good question and I, it certainly needs to be addressed. I don't, I don't presume to have an answer. I, yeah, I think we should. Take a break and one one more question, short one. One more, okay. Okay. Because I don't want. Um, good evening, Mr. Pierce. Thank you for coming here and sharing your life and telling us your ups and downs. Um, <laughs> today is my birthday. I'm born in the early 30s, and I wanted to go somewhere where I would see and hear the future, and I heard it here tonight. And I'm very interested in that house. You said it's 2,200 feet. My house is 2,200 feet. I know what my electric bill is. I want to know what the electric bill will be for that house. Well, first of all, it's not 2,200 feet. That's the elevation. Oh, I, you said. I said it. It's, it's, a, it's the elevation. Oh. It's 2,400 feet above sea, sea level. How many feet is the house? Well, the, uh, God, it's, the, the main house is 2,700 square feet. Uh, there shouldn't be much of it. Well, I don't know what it's going to be. I don't know. Because if we go photovoltaic, there won't be any electric bill. Uh-huh. Oh, that's good then. Thank you very and much. And it doesn't require, you know, there's, it won't require any day, uh, artificial light in the daytime because it's fully naturally lit. So it's going to be, it's going to be good. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome.
you. I, I don't know if you had the same impression of a community as someone bringing together a community of people who are interested in technology as research, as innovation, as artists. And she is, like her dad, an experimentalist who jumps in and tries to figure out what's going on before she figures it out. Then she writes a book about it, you know, in two months or something. Um, anyway, a quick uh, overview here. Her book is called The Interactive Book, A Guide to the Interactive Revolution. Uh, currently, she is a research associate at USC, Annenberg Center for Communication, an adjunct professor and production track head, you have to explain what that means, of interactive media in the School of Cinema Television, and has done many things. Most recently, uh, she organized and held an amazing conference on gaming. This is her recent interest, and hopefully, somehow we get it into academia. So please, warm welcome for Celia. So, so I, have to, I have to repeat the can you hear me routine. Is the, is the, uh, is the mic, I mean, I, the acoustics in here are very odd, so. Um, I'm gonna, huh? I have a mic. The question is, is well, there. It must be working because my beads are rattling it. Let me fix it so that doesn't keep happening. Um, wow, okay. Well, that was kind of a hard act to follow. Um, I, I've been doing a, a lot of uh, lectures and talks lately, and I, because this is such an incredible, I mean, I want to, first of all, thank Victoria for masterminding this whole crazy, wacky idea, which is, is certainly a first and maybe a last for all we know. Um, and I was, <laughs> I was whispering to an old family friend coming in, you know, it's a good thing I had therapy all those years or I never would have been able to get up here after this incredibly brilliant guy and feel like I had anything interesting to say, but I'm gonna do my darndest. Um, and in light of the fact that this is a unique occasion, I thought I would kind of segue into my presentation and I'm gonna spare you a a comprehensive autobiography today. Um, what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about kind of the emergent form that I am as a result of everything you just saw, and then just highlight a couple of specific works that I've done um, that I think directly or indirectly shed some light on the sort of interactions of these ideas. Um, one of the things you know, there's, and I also tend to be very nonlinear. Those of you who know me are aware of that, so I'll just unapologetically go about and do my thing here. Um, I feel incredibly fortunate to have been kind of incubated in an environment where innovation was a foregone conclusion. Um, this whole issue of risk taking and sort of jumping off the cliff is not whether fortunately or unfortunately anything that was ever an option for us. Uh, for me growing up, it was just a given. And one of the things that was amazing to me was both my father and my mother and most of their friends and colleagues are people who defy definition. Um, what do you call Buckminster Fuller? Is he an architect? Is he an inventor? Is he a philosopher? Is he an artist? What is e Charles Eames? He was a filmmaker. He invented the first interactive museum exhibit ever. Uh, he was a, uh, also, in some respects, an artist. Um, my mother was also an artist. She studied at, uh, here at Immaculate Heart College with Corita Kent and was involved in the kind of whole sort of Christian civil rights art thing going on in the late 50s and early 60s. So I grew up in this environment where everybody was sort of self-made and self-invented and there was this kind of renaissance person ethic that was quite ubiquitous. And so for me, it, it's, it's funny because sometimes I'm like, what Victoria was talking about, I never think of what I'm doing as particularly innovative. I just sort of pounce on whatever I'm interested in. And people react the way they react, and you know, hopefully they react in a positive way. Um, from a pretty early age, as you can see, I mean, the bubbles that you saw on the screen, I actually blew with a straw in the backyard of our house. <laughs> um, the curved space 
playground structure, my sister and I were the guinea pigs for, um, we were the first children ever to fly one of those crazy kites you saw. Uh, we understood, we learned the platonic solids before we could add or subtract. So uh, when I was, my dad tells the story when I was a kid that he brought Bucky over to our house and he had hung all the platonic solids and taught them to us from the ceiling of our room and Bucky came in and we proceeded to recite them for him. Oh, there's a octahedron, there's a tetrahedron. I mean, I don't even remember this. I think I was three or four years old, <laughs> literally. Um, my mother was also an early educator, and she sent us to Montessori schools, which were, in many respects, sort of where a lot of the ideas about early interface design fomented the whole idea of heuristic devices and autodidactic systems that were enabled people to teach themselves through exploratory processes is something that, I mean, I literally got by osmosis from just being brought up in that context. Um, and many of the books that I now teach about were on the shelves when I was a kid, Understanding Media, Expanded Cinema. Um, the Medium is the Massage, which I stole from my dad and now have in my own book collection. <laughs> um, borrowed, excuse me. And um, so in some way, I, I have to kind of see myself as a, as a continuity of all of that. Um, what's interesting about it is that a lot of the interests that my dad has, I share, but I come at them from a really different standpoint. Um, for me, the thing that really got, what, what really captivated me as a child was um, story and fantasy. And I read voraciously from a very early age. Um, and I think my first attempt at sort of interactive, deconstructed storytelling. And I, I actually went into my storage room this afternoon to see if I could find this. Um, and I'm thinking about actually doing an art piece. I made, uh, I, I had inherited from a family friend a collection of the original Nancy Drew books. There were I think 13 or 15 of them from the 1920s, the first editions. And uh, you know, she's, they've got illustrations of her driving her little Model A convertible with the rumble seat and this very weird arcane, arca you know, archaic language from the 1920s. And I was really captivated by this curious girl who liked to investigate things and explore things and was very bold and adventurous. And I made a set of paper dolls uh, based on the books, which were done by tracing uh, from my grandmother, who was a seamstress and a, uh, actually a um, costume designer at MGM for many years. I, I traced from her pattern books, and I made these paper dolls. And I, I duplicated the costumes in the book. I mean, I literally read the description of every outfit she had, and I created. And I basically made myself a kind of a narrative Lego construction kit by deconstructing all the elements of the story that had really captivated me. And I spent a lot of time, you know, wearing costumes and speaking in accents and kind of turning all the world into a stage um, as a young girl. And eventually this led to an interest in theater and performance. And from about 11 or 12 years old, I was in plays. And uh, I got involved in theater in, in junior high and also in filmmaking. Uh, and, um, and also got very interested in improvisational theater, which I did, I did pretty rigorously from about 16 to about 19. And the, all of that has really informed on what I subsequently have done. So to kind of bring it to kind of the present in my, and oh, I also had a note here. Make sure to tell them about Coltrane and the speakers. My dad used to put me in my high chair and play Coltrane, put me between the speakers and play. <laughs> Coltrane, which either scrambled my brains or made me a genius, I'm not sure which. Um, the other was my mom took me for an IQ test when I was six years old, and they asked me what was a lecture, and I said, that's what mommies do. So here I am giving a lecture. Um, so what, what, what's interesting to me, and it's, it's so interesting to look at my dad's stuff again and think about the kind of imprint that it left on my brain about how to think. And I want to tell one anecdote that I think really kind of epitomizes that to me. And it's really, it affects how I work now and affects how I see the work of my peers. And he didn't say a thing about it, which I'm, I wish you had talked about how you came up with this nodeless node concept. But 
my dad wanted to, he was studying all these different space stream systems, and he wanted to come up with the ultimate connection, because everything with him has to be the ultimate. So he would spend, you know, he would spend hours and days, and he would do all these different drawings and make these models and come up with these things. And, and um, finally, one day, he, he, he had this revelation. And the revelation was, I'm not trying to make a node. I'm trying to attach struts to each other. And the result was what he dubbed at that time the nodeless node, which was a connector that, was not, that wasn't a connector. It was just a means of connecting parts together. And that idea, the idea of changing the nature of the problem and therefore manifesting a totally unique solution really stuck with me. And it's, it's really completely followed a lot of my, um, my work. Uh, I also want, so I want to qualify a little bit where I'm at right now. Um, I just started working at USC about two years ago. Uh, and prior to that, I spent roughly about, God, I hate to say how many years, uh, 17 or so years in um, the theme park attraction and museum industry. And I got into it actually through someone through a family association, which was Ed Schlossberg, who had worked at CalArts when my dad was there. and who had gone to New York and sort of become a pioneer of interactive exhibit design. And by kind of a bizarre fluke of events, I ended up um, doing some freelance work for them and ultimately getting offered a job and going out there. And it, the thing that I learned there, the, the kind of craft that I kind of glommed onto immediately was this idea of experience design. And what it was about was that it was about creating a context for people to create their own experience. And if there's any one con continuous idea that flows through everything I do, that's it. Um, there aren't that many. I mean, I'm all over the place, as you'll see momentarily. My trajectory is not as direct as my dad's. It's like, you know, that. Um, <laughs> so uh, what, I'm what I'm doing right now is I've been kind of making this transition to Ah, take off your necklace. It's messing up the sound. Okay, wait. Oh, oops. Talk about a nonlinear. Okay. All right. I'm taking my necklace off. Thank you very much, Victoria. You know, I know, and and you know what? I knew it was doing it, but I was kind of trying to get on a roll here, and so here. You can wear it for the rest of. So um, now I've completely lost my train of thought. Uh, OK, so what I'm trying to say here is what? OK, so I went to New York. I got involved in this idea of experience design. And it's, it's come, it's, it manifests in a lot of different ways. But the basic idea behind it is that uh, what I try to do is think about creating, uh, or the way I describe it is that the job of the interactive designer is to understand what to leave out. So what I try to do in, in everything that I do is I try to make a space for the other person who's going to be coming into this experience and making it happen. And a lot of the influences that I had from early on, and it's funny because Ed, I mean, Ed Schlossberg is a very controversial character, but I ha you know, he was very influential on me, and his influences were very influential on me, which was a lot of sort of Dada artists and Flux artists and uh, John Cage and this whole kind of idea of, you know, what I like to talk about it as the structure of experience or the structure of time and the idea of creating systems in a sense that create experiences, if that makes any sense. Um, one of the first things I got involved in when I worked for Schlossberg was game design. And games really intrigued me because they were these very logical, rational structures that facilitated this kind of improvisational, organic experience. And I ended up spending a lot of time there doing play testing, which was very useful to me and became kind of a groundwork for everything that I have done. So I'm kind of in this, what I was about to say was I'm, I'm kind of in this transitional phase right now. I feel kind of like a work in progress. So I'm kind of coming to you in, the, in midstream of a bunch of things happening and kind of giving you a status report, I suppose. Um, so I'm going to show three particular projects which are very, uh, oh, just to touch base on a couple of early influences. So also as a child, I was really intrigued by um, two of my favorite places were um, Disneyland and the Hearst Castle. 
And the reason I liked these places was because I felt that I was immersed. You know, as I would read these books or I would put these costumes on, I wanted to become immersed in these fictional worlds. And as soon as I would go to those places, it was like it, it was like a spatial story. It was like having my imagination unfold in front of me in this really exciting way. And I liked the fact that it wasn't linear. I liked the fact that it wasn't, I mean, I love movies, but I liked the fact that it wasn't giving me it in a certain order, that I could kind of be in it and be part of it instead of just be observing it. So working, uh, working at Schlossberg, which I did from, 80, uh, from 83 to 89, I got to explore this both in terms of museums and also attractions in game design. So in 1993, I ended up kind of getting invited back to Los Angeles. Oh, and I, I should say Roy has left. Roy Walford, who was uh, an inhabitant of the biosphere, um, I actually rent a loft space from him now, so he's kind of, he lived in my dad's house and now I live in his house. Um, uh, I did, I actually ended up designing a visitor center for the biosphere uh, in 1989, which was also kind of an interesting uh, connection back to my dad's work. But anyway, in 1993, I was invited by uh, iWorks Entertainment, which is a ride film company here in Burbank, to come to Los Angeles and creative direct a project that at the time was pretty stupendously amazing. It was, uh, they had made a deal with Evans and Sutherland, which was the company that had in invented virtual reality and had basically one of the top flight simulation systems in the world. And they had sort of run out of military contracts in light of the, you know, Cold War warming up, as it were. And uh, they needed someone else with big enough bucks to support them, so they came to Hollywood. And um, they formed this partnership with, actually, they met them in Europe, oddly enough. They formed this partnership with Irish Entertainment, and they decided they wanted to make this really exciting family oriented VR game. And uh, they searched far and wide, and they interviewed all these game designers, and they got them all the right treatments. And um, I was the only girl, and I was the only person who didn't write a violent game. So um, they liked my ideas, and they liked the, the approach that I was taking to the project. And because of the work I had done at Schlossberg was really focused on what I call social technology. Everything we did there, we were, we were networking computers together in 1983 when you couldn't do it. I mean, we were building our own everything because nothing, you couldn't make color pictures on anything but a Sony computer in those days, which, of course, went away and came back. Um, we were completely making this stuff up. And what I was really, at that point, felt that I had really a strong sensibility and passion for was thinking about technology as a way of mediating that allowed people some kind of emotional freedom. And some of the work that we had done at Schlossberg, and particularly through play testing, it was a great, we had a training, a stock trading game that we did, and there was this really amazing phenomenon that would happen. It was a, it was a series of touch screens, eight people in a circle, and each person had a phone, and they were supposed to be brokers, and they had these touch screens with these like icons on them. And people would do this funny thing. They would look at each other, they would agree to make a trade, and then they would call each other on the phone, <laughs> even though they were literally three feet away from each other. And when they, as soon as they would get on the phone, they would change, and they would start acting like a broker. And I really became aware that you could use technology as almost kind of like a masquerade ball kind of idea where by creating some form of mediation, people could express certain aspects of their personality that they might not normally express. And in every one of these games, it was very important that people share the same physical space. They had to have eye contact. That was one of the number one criteria. And the other criteria was that they had to be both cooperative and competitive. So those kind of ideas were very prevalent to my thinking. So what I'm going to do now is somehow or another go, go over there, <coughs> maybe talk to you while I'm moving back here to put the first tape in. Um, and this is... Uh, Virtual Adventures. Am I doing this right? Okay. I hate I hate operating these kinds of devices when I'm trying to think in a straight line. Oh, do I have to push some buttons or something? Uh, <coughs> mode. And the uh, the yeah. Loch Ness Expedition is the first of many adventures to be developed by the iWorks and Evans and Sutherland team. All right, can you? Uh, All right, team. You're can now you replace the moments from departure. Your mission is to 
Okay. How do I get it to play? You are part of a team of six scientists exploring the mysterious Loch Ness in search of Nessie and her endangered eggs. The three other teams taking part in your adventure appear on your screen as evil body hunters. The goal is to rescue Nessie's eggs from threatening sea creatures and the body hunters. Each team must work together to locate and retrieve the eggs while fending off the other ships. And the funny thing is, what is that? I went to the right place to give slideshows most of the places I go to. Okay, well, they're sorting that out. I'm just going to battle. Uh, I'll explain to you what this thing is. You do want to rewind it. Okay, um, so what this is is a 24 player game. Uh, it consists of four submarine pods of, with six players each, and each player has a unique controlling device. And when I designed the, the game and developed the interface strategy, and, and there was a large team involved, but I basically designed the game structure, the game story, wrote a description of what it should look like, and also wrote a description of the control scenario. And the idea was that everyone had to work together. And the, 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 what I was trying to do was sort of craft a social interaction and then build the technology around it. So, if ever you see the image on the screen, uh, what you will see is a group of six people, each of whom is doing something different, of which the totality of all these activities is what enables you to reach the objective of the game, which is to save the Loch Ness Monster's eggs. Now, remember this is a theme park ride, and you know the funny thing is I gave this talk in Vienna about two, two years ago on information. The Loch Ness Expedition yeah, is the first of many adventures to be developed by the iWorks and, and then, Evans um, and I Sutherland team. And people were very disappointed. Oh, I see. Now I'm placing the bullet from departure. But you Location. have to remember that this is a theme park ride, so um, it's not really meant to be interesting. It's meant to be fun. You are part of a team of six scientists <laughs> um, exploring so the mysterious Loch Ness in search. Uh, and. Um, so this is just a brief clip. It's taken off of a, one of iWorks promotional tapes. It's got the nice hypey guy's voice going, you know, the, the high tech entertainment. But it shows people playing the game and kind of what the game environment looks like. And um, this is the first time I, I dealt with network environments, but it was the first time I'd ever dealt with 3D graphics. And when I first started working on the project, I had the great fortune of working with engineers who spoke English. And the first time I met them, uh, we were sitting at this big conference table in San Jose, and they said, okay, uh, we know you've never done this before, so we're going to tell you what, how it's done. And in 10 minutes, they explained the whole thing to me in a like, completely clear, articulate way. And to this day, I still do pretty much exactly what they do in class. They said, everything is made out of triangles. Uh, every 3D object, every, everything you see on the screen is made out of triangles. And I went, oh, that's easy. <laughs> I've already done that. I already get that. And, uh, and we just need to make sure that there's not so many triangles on the screen that they crash the computer. And I went, OK, that's easy to understand. <laughs> and then we make it look pretty by putting these texture maps on it. And uh, we play all these tricks on the eyes so that you think you're seeing 3D objects when you're really just seeing a lot of triangles. So that was pretty easy for me to grasp. And someday, is it ready? All right, here we go. And the audio is pretty important too, so we should make sure it's. The Loch Ness Expedition is the first of many adventures to be developed by the iWorks and Evans and Sullivan team. All right, team, you're now in place of moments from departure. Your Lock mission is to provide assistance to Nessie, the Loch Ness monster, by collecting at least one of her eggs. You are part of a team of six scientists exploring the mysterious Loch Ness in search of Nessie and her endangered eggs. The three other teams taking part in your adventure appear on your screen as evil body hunters. The goal is to rescue Nessie's eggs from threatening sea creatures and the body hunters. Each team must work together to locate and retrieve the eggs while fending off the other ships. Someone shoot you! What is that? Oh, oh, what? Oh, oh, what is that? Oh, oh, oh. Blue slug, blue slug, right on the right! Blue slug, on the right! You've got to drop the eggs!
Virtual Adventures tells a story using interactivity in a way that brings the whole family together. It's more than a ride, it's a movie, and it's an adventure that you control. So I'm going to just, uh, I guess I've said most of what I want to say about this. I have another tape, but I'm going to skip it in the interest of time. But anyway, so you get the, you get the idea here. And, and what we were trying to do, what I was trying to do with this is create a narrative environment, which is kind of what I've come to call these spaces that I work on, at least in the, most of my commercial uh, professional works have been in this area. And um, it's actually got a three-act structure. There's a pre-show that sets the story up and gives a little training session. And then there's two acts in the vehicle. And the whole thing is three minutes in the vehicle. It's a total eight-minute experience. Um, so it's an interesting form to work in for interactive media, especially for game designers, because most game designers in the, in the main uh, home consumer market have games which are supposed to afford about 40 hours of playtime. So we have to do this thing where we make a very short form experience, but then has a lot high repeatability factor. This, this piece um, was first uh, launched in 1993, at the end of 1993, and it was introduced at SIGGRAPH uh, Computer Graphics Show in 94. It was in the electronic theater. It won about eight awards, and it was a total commercial disaster. And I can see that immediately that I was following in my father's footsteps. Um, <laughs> which is why I'm now in academia. And in any event, um, it was kind of an interesting lesson, though, because it had everything going for it. I mean, in the few places that it was installed, it was one of the most popular attractions. People that played it really liked it. People that operated it. I went to a, a venue where it was in Connecticut, and the people that, were, that ran it, uh, I had a little tag on my briefcase that, with the ship on it. And they were like, where did you get that? And I said, well, I, I kind of like designed this thing. Like, you did? And they said, well, you know, it's really fun. We play it all the time. These are just the regular attendees. And when people weren't there, they would play the game all day long. <laughs> so that was, that was pretty exciting to me, because most people that operate these things end up hating them pretty quickly. Um, so that was kind of before I entered theme park. I actually ended up, after that, working, doing some more of this kind of VR work. But I also started working for architects. And in fact, the Journey Partnership, which was one of my dad's clients, also ended up being one of my clients as they kind of got into the whole theme architecture area. And I ended up writing a lot of scripts for architects and kind of moving back and forth between the, the kind of virtual space and the architectural space. Um, so the next project I want to talk about, and what happened to it, oh, here we go, is this thing right here. and. Um, this is the book that Victoria alluded to. It's very fat. Um, and I want to talk about the book just briefly, not so much in terms of you know, promoting it or anything, but to talk about it as an interactive work. Um, the, this book was written in about a three-month period of time. And the process of writing it was extremely organic. It was. Uh, kind of, I mean, I had written a lot of the notes and ideas down, but what happened was that I began to write, and I was using a Macintosh computer, and um, I would write multiple chapters simultaneously. I'd start one chapter, and it would give me an idea, and I would start another chapter. And so I started like writing pointers in between the different chapters, because this idea led to that idea, led to this idea, and it sort of my brain ends up looking like one of those big structures that my dad built with all the network things pointing every which way. And uh, I, I knew all along that it was going to be a hypertext book and that all the references were going to kind of point to each other. But I had this idea that somehow there would be some sequence to it. And, um, and I basically just, for three months, I got in advance. And I just wrote like all the time, constantly. Did some reading, wrote some more. Most of it is a lot of the record of my own personal experience, sort of pre-internet, post-internet all the different cycles. Uh, there's a bunch of things in here about, and one of the things I'm really interested in is patterns, um, but more sort of patterns of behavior. So there's a bunch of stuff in here about cycles of how media evolve and various kinds of mistakes that keep getting made over and over again. And my new slogan is um, learn from the past and make more innovative mistakes. So um, when all the chapters were done, I sent them all to my publisher. And then we had this discussion about what order to put them in. And Ultimately, we gave up because we realized that there was no way to put them in any order. And 
as we were having this discussion, what we ended up doing was putting the chapters in alphabetical order and indexing them. So you see on the side there's uh, letters. And you can basically open this book at random, read a chapter, and it will take you to another chapter, or you can go in the front and figure out where you want to start. But what's neat about it is that, like all the work that I've done, once I let go of it, it takes on a life of its own. And people come back to me and, and tell me about their experience of reading it. And what I realized what I had sort of inadvertently done, although probably on purpose but subconsciously, was made a book that people could make their own book. So some people only read parts of it that are interesting to them, and they follow the certain trajectory that interests them. Other people I know have read it several times, which I find frightening. Um, one person read it three times in succession. I was like, are you insane? Um, but what ends up happening is that everybody has their own version of it. And that's kind of, to me, the ultimate goal, that this book isn't really mine. It belongs to whoever reads it in whatever way they choose to use it. Um, and I'm now going to show a um, performance piece, and hopefully we get this tape thing worked out. Um, I'm just going to show a few different fragments of this because there's several different versions of it. Um, and this is... Uh, Okay, let's see here. Uh, this is a piece, so, oh, there it is. I can't see any of the buttons on this VCR, so. Hmm? Hmm? No, that's the one I just showed. Uh, so this video, I'm, I'm just going to show like bits and pieces of this performance. Um, this has been done on three different occasions, um, twice at the Electronic Cafe in Madison. Can I pause it for a second? Oh, the, actually, no, you can run this part, because I'll just talk over it, because this is less. So this is kind of short. The piece is called Body of Light. And the person on the left is sitting right there. I usually work with two camera operators who kind of act like kabuki set movers and move around and shoot me uh, while, I'm, while I'm moving. And part of the idea here is it's not really so much a dance as it is a revealing of images. And so the, the choreography or the improv is... This is not right. The Loch Ness Expedition is the first... The choreography is essentially about the image, not about the body. That the body just becomes a medium uh, for the image to, to come through, if you will. So this is a, this is one of the performances that we did um, at Electronic Cafe. And if you see this, you can kind of get a feeling. And it should be sound. No sound? So that's what you would see on the screens, essentially the composite image. 
And this part is done with just projection, where I'm wearing all white and projecting on uh, onto my body these words and images. show a few other um, clips from other performances. Um, we had a saxophone player and a keyboard player also. And um, part of the idea with this was that it, it had to be improvisational. We, we actually didn't really rehearse at all. We kind of came up with the structure and I wrote a score. Um, uh, Kit Galloway, who's sitting in the back, was the Blendo operator who basically mixed all the video and ran the chroma key. And then we had two camera operators. This is another sequence from a different performance. I think this is from the one we did at Banff. Uh, and it's going to show uh, it's a little, another projection sequence, and then I'll show you some of the um, some of the blue screen stuff. too is every time we do it we do it slightly differently the first time we did it we had a, an our artist who had uh, these sort of interactive uh, graphical objects that we used for the blue screen image oops ah, it's going too fast um, and then we also uh, worked with uh, in this one I'm about to show you these are videos that I actually took at Banff the day before the performance so I was trying to kind of contextualize the performance to the location. And for anybody who's been up there, 
Um, it's a really beautiful natural environment, so this became kind of a different kind of expression than when we were doing it with computer graphics. I give blue gloves to the audience members and I bring them up on stage and have them um, interact with me and the imagery. And eventually I'd, I'd like to do something with this blue glove thing on a really large scale where we have, you know, uh, large groups of people dealing with media this way and I'll show you the, sorry about the spastic really fast stuff but I don't have this cued on here properly. Um, okay. She had too much coffee and now she's really out of control. Okay, I think this is coming up. So at a certain point, we uh, go out to the audience. Let's see how that works. Can't really see this very well from here. Uh, oh, that's the swimming pool. Oh, we missed that. So at this point, now I go out and I start handing the Okay, so there's Sarah with her hands, right? recent art piece that I've done, uh, which probably half the people in this room uh, have participated in. Um, ah, brilliant. And hopefully my computer will behave itself and I will be able to open up. Okay. So this is a, um, one of the things that I like to do is um, not necessarily work with technology because I think that 
the whole idea of interactivity is so tied in with computers in a way that I, I really find bothersome. And I do, a lot of the talks that I do have to do with non-computer based interactivity, um, including some fine art lectures and what have you. Um, but this particular, um, that's fine, we don't need a socket connection, thank you very much for your time. Uh, okay, so um, this, is a, this is a piece called um, Public Emergence Procedural Painting Number 2. And I don't know why it's number two. Uh, I just decided that it wasn't number one. And um, so I'm just going to show you a little bit of this. And as I said, a lot of you have seen this because you actually are going to be in these pictures, which I hope you aren't too embarrassed by. So the idea of this was um, it actually started out, um, I, went to, I went to some art exhibits, and it actually started out from a conversation I had with Victoria and her partner, Bob. And basically, the discussion was, why do people paint anymore? And this really plagued me for like days on end. And then I had this revelation, and I woke up in the middle of the night with this idea and, um, and was sort of hell-bent on doing it right away. So I spent my Christmas vacation doing this crazy thing. And the idea of this was I wanted to make an interactive painting. And I wanted it to be paint, not pixels. Um, and I wanted it to be public, not in a museum. I wanted it to be a public, kind of popular public environment. And I wanted it to be a game. And I live in this building, which Roy Walford owns, in a loft which has a 12 by 8 foot blank wall in front of it. And so I spent my Christmas vacation painting this wall black and drawing on this wall a grid of 8 by 8 inch squares. And then on New Year's Eve, I invited some people to come and launch this piece. And it started out with me doing what you're seeing here, which is writing the instructions. And the instructions were pretty simple. They were basically that you were to um, make this window a little bit bigger. You were to, um, to only paint in a single square, and you were to paint a contiguous image from the adjacent images. And I wrote these instructions in English and Spanish. And then people started to fill in the squares. And you can see the grid there. So this is the first person, um, a guy named Michael Fell, painting the first square. This is the second person, or later person. And you can see this thing kind of evolving. Um, you'll notice immediately that people did not follow the instructions of making their lines contiguous with the adjacent squares. So this was my first grappling was, oh my god, they're breaking the rules. What do I do? And it's funny, because Victoria and I have talked about this, because she had a, 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 a piece where people broke the rules, and she decided to enforce them. But I decided very consciously not to enforce them. I also decided very consciously not to paint a square, because I really wanted to be absent. I wanted my absence to be my presence in this piece. Um, it's very much inspired by Yoko Ono and some of her work, painting to add color, painting to shake hands, etc. And it was interesting because because it was the front of my house, it was a very personal thing because I was kind of like offering my like chest to the world here. These people are not part of the original inv invitational group. They were pa random passers-by, and I believe these two people are actually homeless people. And they started to get in on the act. Um, and eventually what happened over the course of the first day was that, there's my dad right there, um, people that were not part of the original group immediately started adding to the painting. And this happened much more rapidly than I had ever anticipated. Those are my nephews, my grandmother, my nephew. Um, but these people are from like visiting from Indiana. And they were walking by on their way back from the beach, and they started to paint. And this is them. And they actually decided to paint two squares together. They asked me if that was OK, and I said it was fine. There's my grandmother, who'd never painted in her life, but has a granddaughter and a daughter who are an artist. <laughs> Um, and these people continued throughout the night. Um, and I went into my house and closed the door and left the paint out. And you can see right here the paint cup and the paintbrush. And people continued. And these are the last ones I photographed. But um, they kept on coming. And you can see, so this is basically what the painting looked like around, I don't know around what time, New Year's Eve, fairly like 10, 10 or 11 o'clock at night. Um, I promptly went to sleep um, and woke up and drove to Las Vegas to be in an Elvis wedding, which is a whole other story. 
Victoria was also there. Um, and when I came back, uh, this, is, this is what it looked like when I left. This is what it looked like when I got back from Las Vegas about 20 hours later. So in the course of one day, it doubled in size, completely unsupervised by me. And it was amazing because I really did not expect this to happen. I didn't think people would be so forthcoming in, in adding to this piece. And it just went on like this over the course of about two weeks. And very quickly, it, it did this. And I remember at one point standing in front of it, somewhere between this phase and this phase. And I had this moment where I was really upset because it was clear that nobody was following this contiguous line rule. It was clear that it looked absolutely nothing like what I had thought it was supposed to look like. And it was clear that in the decision to abdicate aesthetic control, what I really needed to do was abdicate aesthetic control and accept the fact that I had given this up. I had given this over to other people and that what it was was no longer mine. And that was a pretty amazing kind of like artistic revelation for someone who spent a lot of time thinking about that kind of a thing. Um, these are uh, random people that came by, um, and one of the things that was interesting was that, so it filled up to the point where you couldn't reach it anymore. This is uh, what it looked like, I think, about four days into it, maybe five. And it's amazing, I mean, when you, when you stand, and it's really kind of neat, because when you look at it from across the street or the bus, I live across the street from a bus stop, it's got this whole gestalt. But then when you go up next to it, you can see each of the separate articulated images, of which some people really kind of fit themselves into a larger whole, and other people were just completely autonomous and oblivious to the fact they were part of something bigger than themselves. And to me, it became this kind of urban map of community life, because this is how people are. Some people pay attention to what's around them, and some people don't. And that's kind of what this, how this evolved. And it just blew me away. It was also, it's very much also derivative of games like SimCity, where there's this kind of emergent structure that happens over time. So this is the last couple of days, and we're going to see some familiar faces here. Um, let's see these images load up. Um, and I'm, I still haven't finished doing the damn website. These are some other people that, that came down. Um, and this is kind of a, an image of the whole thing as it's evolving it further. Um, here's some close-up shots. Very interesting stuff. I mean, you get this kind of graffiti here. And then you get people that spend a really long time. I mean, some of these images are very thought out and developed and, you know, thematic and all kinds of weird stuff. I mean, it was just wacky. And this, is this your, Victoria, is this yours here? Where did she go? Oh, I guess she left. OK. Um, this is a, so it's this amazing kind of combination. Here are some other people adding to it, people coming by. I put a sign on the door. Some of these are people I knew, but I put a sign on the door. Um, and at some point, and I don't know if, the, oh, here, here we go. This is Victoria. Here's Victoria. Oh, no, she drew the spiral. And there's Angelica. And there's Bob, who painted my favorite, which is the solid white square. Um, this trash can appeared mysteriously overnight, which was clearly a, someone was trying to imp improvise a way to get up high without the ladder. And it actually, I let it stay there for a while until eventually it got squished from so much standing on it. Um, but here are a few other, this is, Larry, if Larry's still there, there's his daughter. And you can, there's Larry. And uh, so you can see that this, this kind of, this really amazed me. So this is the, the final little anecdote. I was leaving one night to go over to Jody's house, actually, to download some of my digital images from this very project. And I saw these people trudging down the street carrying this blue ladder. And I knew exactly what they were up to. And I, I said, are you going to, the, to paint? And they said, yes. And I said, oh, OK, well, let me take your picture. So I took their picture. and. Um, one of the things that happened that was really interesting was after the painting was kind of had reached critical mass, people kept coming back to look at it. People would paint and then they would come back a few days later to see what had been added since they had last been there. And this woman came back, uh, this is her boyfriend, and he had drawn this funny um, 
sort of icon that was kind of a just say no to drugs thing with a crack pipe and a line through it. And about four days later, and, and I would be in my house and I would hear people talking outside and I would open the door and they'd be like, oh, is this your thing? And I'd go, yeah, and they'd go. And, and, they'd, and I'd sit and talk to them about it. And it was really fascinating because I, the whole conversation became a whole part of the piece that I had, really hadn't anticipated. Um, I also got a chance to talk about it on the radio, and as a result, a bunch of people kind of drove by to look at it, including my postman from the post office down the street. Um, but she comes back about three or four days later to tell me that her boyfriend has, as a result of having done this painting, has decided to check himself into a rehab and deal with his drug problem. So I just, you know, it was just a very powerful experience for me to realize that, you know, most people are not encouraged to make art. In museums, they're told not to touch anything. And here on this public street in Venice, California, which is like the funkiest place in the world, um, they got this permission to create and express themselves. And the results were really amazing. And I, you know, it's, it's there now in its, in its sort of maximum full phase. There's a few squares left. But I've been thinking a lot about what to do next with it, because I think I'd like to do it in other locations. And, maybe you know, do new versions of it here. But um, the thing that was really cool about it was that, look, Ma, no computers. <laughs> you know, it, it was a, an ability to invite people into a process without having technology either facilitate it or, as we've seen, get in its way. So um, I think that's basically my presentation. Um, so I'm going to open it up to questions. And thank you all for coming and for sharing this <laughs> unique experience. Any questions? Yeah, we can turn the lights up. And all the diehards stuck it out. Here we go. I tried to be yes, more your, your, your hypothesis is that that technology uh, structures behavior, or how did you how did you phrase well, that? Well, I'm interested in the idea of, of mediation, and even in in doing this this piece, this is also a mediated social environment. I mean, it's not a technologically mediated social environment, but it's it's a place for people to have a kind of a social interaction that's, you know, in the movie industry they have this term, the MacGuffin, which is the, the thing that you think the story is about that it's not really about. And that's sort of what these things are to me. This isn't really a, this is a, this is a social space. People think it's a painting, but it's really, what was more interesting to me was how people interacted with each other and how the images interact with each other. So what I'm interested in is creating frameworks or structures that allow people to express those social dynamics in unique ways. And sometimes technology is really good for that, and sometimes other things are good for it. And you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time studying board games like chess and checkers and Monopoly, and looking at Monopoly as a narrative, and looking at kind of, if you give people some parameters to interact in, what happens? And so they can take a full range of forms, and it doesn't necessarily have to be technologically driven, but to me the most interesting thing is what the people are doing. And that's kind of whatever I build around that, it all starts in that, in that framework. Um, I have a question for both Pierce's senior and junior, <laughs> if uh, the senior is still here. Yeah, he's um, and he's awake. Yeah, he's cool. Awake. But it's two, it's two different questions. Um, yeah, you'll get your question in a sec. Hold on. First, Celia's, which is you've made a point of how your work was influenced by and drew on your dad's work. In what way has your work rebelled against oh, his work? Oh, that's a great question. And wait, or should I give yeah, should yeah, I give his and his question or let you do it first? Okay. Well, I'll tell you a way. That, a very very distinct rebellion is that my dad is is without question a modernist. He comes from that tradition. His work is, I mean, he's taken it to another level. But some of the basic tenets and ideas behind modernism are very much in his work. And I think where we, where we part paths is that when I was a child, I was raised with the idea that decor was like immoral, that you know, having lots of trim and this whole thing he was saying about the wall here, you're, you're not allowed to hide anything. Everything has to be exposed. And, and I was very interested in theater and illusion. And, to me, a narrative space was more, or a space was more about the experience you had in it than what the structure was. 
And so I think that's where we, where we kind of diverge. And I think the irony is I end up in the theming industry, which is probably the most abhorrent thing to him, I would imagine, from a standpoint of someone who's interested in sort of this pure idea of structure where I'm really interested in illusion and narrative and theater. So, I mean, I know it's not really important to you, but I'm just saying there's a kind of, you can't, don't ever talk to my dad about postmodernism. <laughs> just, just don't do it. Be warned. Okay. Yeah. And part two is, um, how has your daughter's work influenced you? <laughs> he always asks really good questions. I know, I can give you one answer. He has email. <laughs> he wouldn't have had email if it wasn't for me. Who is this bastard? <laughs> <laughs> He's from Chicago. Oh yeah, um, what's your name? Nice to meet you. Um, I think I, I can only answer your question by, by sharing an anecdote probably. Um, but I, I'd like to respond, I'd like to make one other comment first <laughs> to, to Celia's comments, <laughs> if I may, which is that I, I love theater, I go to the movies, I go to the theater, I love music, but theater and design are two different things. And when they get confused, <laughs> it makes me uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> The answer, the anecdote I was going to tell you was that when Celia delivered her book to me, I began to read it and... Uh, Did you read it linearly? Yes. Yeah. Well, actually I read it both ways. I read it, I don't know where to put this. Is this okay? Yeah. Sound wise? Um, so I I'm, I'm, had a number of reactions, but first the, the context of this is, you know, when you're some, when somebody's your child, or you're their parent, there's a there's a filter involved in the interaction, right? That's like out of control. You you have no, it's just organic in the relationship over all the years, you know, the decades or whatever. So when you sit, when I sit with Celia and talk to her, you know, you know, at the same table or whatever, or over the phone that filter in some ways is always operating. So you have a certain perception. I mean, like she tells me her ideas in that context. And she's telling them because I'm there in a certain way that she might not be telling somebody else if you follow my drift. And I might respond in a way to her directly that if I heard those ideas from a third party, I would also respond differently. So I'm reading the book and I'm saying, wow, this is really interesting, you know? I mean, it's like, first of all, it's, it's an impression of Celia that I never got ever from sitting with her because it becomes obvious that, first of all, she's been paying attention all these years from school and from her environment and everything else because it's all there in that book. And I'm thinking, damn, she's really a smart lady. I mean, I knew that, but um, it, it just was, it was a very interesting experience for me to, because it's viewing her in a detached, a more objective way. Um, it doesn't remotely answer your question. <laughs> um, well, you know, I, get, I guess the, the answer to your question specifically is that um, Sully was my guinea pig in terms, particularly when I was doing the, the toys and things. And uh, so there was, and I, I was involved in teaching Head Start and teaching geometry to kids and various things. This, this goes back, you know, circa 19, whatever, 40 years ago or something. Not quite. She's not quite that old. But. So I would round up the kids and I would, Celia and Alita, and try things on them and see how they responded. And that definitely was a a factor in the conclusions I came to as a toy designer. So we too were your experiments. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, of course. <laughs> That's all.
Thank you. Uh, what is your best Buck Minister Fuller story? My best what? Your best Buck Minister Fuller story. I was fortunate enough to hear him lecture before he died. And also, uh, I did, uh, I used to work for the LA Times Home Magazine. I did a layout on him in 1981 when they had the bicentennial here. And so I was, uh, was a paradigm shift for me when I heard him lecture. And uh, you said you remember him as a child? Well, you know, it's funny because with him, I mean, the story about the polyhedrons hanging from the ceiling that I told earlier, I don't actually remember that because I was way too little. Um, with him, I don't really, I have kind of more of a recollection of his gestalt than anything specific that he said. I remember thinking that he was, I mean, I knew more about him from what was said about him around me than what he said, of which I will spare everyone by repeating any of that. But he, he was, you know, I think it's, it was more the stuff he did, seeing the dome structures and seeing the inventions and kind of this, again, this idea of the Renaissance person. Like, I knew he was somebody really special and that he sort of defied any definition. And uh, the, the person I actually remember much more distinctly is Charles Eames, because he was much more kind of an ongoing presence. And um, again, it's like you're, you're little. You don't understand the, the words, but you understand the concepts. And I remember going to the Eames office and playing with the big pachinko, the infamous pachinko machine, and messing around with the little pieces and changing the tune. and the cards. To me, it was the whole experience of exposure to that environment was extremely tactile and sensory. Um, and even with the jazz music, I mean, it was all this kind of stuff that was around all the time. And I remember a certain age, probably in junior high school, starting to pull the books off the shelf and, and look at them. And I remember looking at the McLuhan stuff and kind of having a sort of a grasp on it at a fairly young age. Um, and the pictures, a lot of images, you know, the fuller images. And my dad had done some drawings for one of his books, and I remember I have a strong recollection of that. But not so much what people said, because I think I, I was not quite old enough yet to. So I keep uh, going back to the Loch Ness monster thing, and the idea there are two acts and a preface in eight minutes. And I, I guess I'm, I'm, I guess I'm wondering what, if you could talk a little bit about your idea of experience in relation to spaces and duration. And you know, it, it just eight minutes seems like an interesting kind of issue. And how does duration relate to? creating an experience that's valuable or engaging or whatever? That's a great question. And I, had I had more, had I allowed myself more time, I actually have some other images here about the thing that I'm working on now, which is architecture as a storytelling medium, where I'm really investigating the more in-depth, you, know, you, don't, you don't really want to torture yourself with that at this point, right? Everyone's half asleep already. Um, but what I'm investigating right do you mind? No. All right. Um, this is a, it, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what form this is going to take. It, it could be a, uh, it could be a book, it could be a TV series, it could be an interactive thing, it could be all three. Ideally, I'd like it to be all three. But it's kind of in its research mode right now, and it, I keep reiterating it as a kind of an ongoing morphing lecture. Um, and to a answer your question, with virtual adventures, um, the, the constraint of the time is more about the fact that it's a game than the fact that it's a space. But what it forced us to do was constrain the space. So the space you're in is completely, it's like the size of this room, essentially. I mean, it's actually bigger, but from a scale, human to room scale. And you can't go outside of it. And because there's a goal, and you have a finite amount of time to meet that goal, and that game wouldn't work at all if you had more than three minutes, because it's too simplistic. It's basically an Easter egg hunt. I always describe it as the Little Mermaid meets an Easter egg hunt meets Godzilla. It's, it's 
I was trying to come up with an activity that you could do satisfactorily in three minutes. Anything more sophisticated than that. So the narrativity of it is a lot of the backstory piling on where you have all these funny people that you're interviewing that are talking about seeing a Loch Ness monster and then the scientists who've been studying it and this theory about it being a lasmosaur. So it sort of builds this whole backstory up. So once you're in there, you're kind of, that's all feeding your experience. Um, but it's much more about achieving the goal than exploring the space. With, with what I'm doing with this now is I'm trying to look at narrative conventions and architecture throughout the entire history of the human race. So um, this being the first identifiable narrative environment that I could locate, the cave, uh, the Alaska cave paintings. And when I first started showing this to my students, I was showing it to them in context of a history of dimensions and the sort of ongoing attempt of people to create more and more dimensional expressions on the surface. But as I began to study it further, I discovered that it was, in fact, a dark ride. Um, that, in fact, what it was was a series of scenes and a series of chambers that were somewhat narrative, uh, not highly evolved, but each one was a specific kind of little scenario. I also have come to find out since then that there are a number of theories now about how these things were lit. Um, since they had to be lit by flame, there are some theories that they were actually meant to be animated, that the idea of having them be lit by a moving light source was something that uh, both these artists and other cave artists, particularly ones that were doing carvings, were experimenting with moving light to create the illusion of motion. Um, so here's a few little scenes. All of them depict animals, but they're, they're clearly action-oriented. These are not portraits. They're actually studies of scenes. Um, one of the things I haven't integrated into this yet, but I, I'm working on now, is um, Egyptian stuff. And one, a thing that I've discovered that's very interesting is how religious narratives are expressed through space throughout history and how the destruction of those spaces is kind of like equivalent to burning books. That people go and they ruin other people's temples to say, no, your story is wrong and our story is right. Um, so I'm looking right now at Akhenaten, who was the pharaoh of the sun that was just here who was trying to create a monotheistic um, mythology, which uh, he did by creating temples, which were then later dismantled by his successors. So this is a shark cathedral. And this really blew me away when I started looking at this, because first of all, the, the whole form of it, you know, and speaking of form, if you look at this not for its structural form, but for its narrative form, it, it's got a very clear message. The message is, look up. <laughs> Um, it's all about up. And if you look at the layout, and I've basically identified kind of four areas. One is kind of this thing I call explicit narrative, which is a specific story that we're being told in the space. And to quote from Godard, a story must have a beginning, a middle, and end, but not necessarily in that order. The use of a space like this is as a ritualistic space. It was developed at a time when the followers of this religion were primarily illiterate and could not speak the language of the mass. So what they got was this deconstructed narrative which surrounded them in this space, which was also a theater of ritual. So the, the ritual itself becomes part of the narrative of the space, and then the story on the walls. And, um, but what really intrigued me was, which was kind of a revelation, was the exterior when I realized that, every th that there is literally a physical narrative structure, the building is made of people. Every single column in this building is a character. And every architectural, structural component, these are scenes from the Bible at the top of column heads. So there's this incredible physicalization of narrative here that, that predates the, the printed book, or the mass-produced printed book. And it really kind of... As I study these in more depth, I realize just how strong these kind of narrative elements are. And these are just a few details, and I love this because look how evocative that simple little image is. You know, there's, there's a whole kind of emotional content there that expressed in that one structure, you know, that one piece of architecture, essentially. And there's some examples of the stained glass windows, which of course depict the whole progression of Christ's life in a pretty, again, a very formal structure. Not <laughs> if I may say, an Aristotelian structure, which I just got in a bunch of fights with literary theorists last weekend in Providence, Rhode Island about, um, 
to, to quick move to another zone. This is uh, the, the Swiss Family Robinson Treehouse in Disneyland, which is really interesting in that there is a, a clear narrative arc here. There is a story. These people crashed, they rebuilt their life out of the detritus of their former life, and they were somehow able to maintain their culture and integrate it with the sort of natural resources made available to them. You can map that as a narrative arc, but, and this really answers your question very directly, but you don't find it in that order. You infer it. You see the evidence of it. Um, I love, you know, the, the mixture here. This is great. There's books everywhere in this, which just speaks to the idea of these people trying to kind of carry their lifestyle into this new context. Um, this is a, a project that some friends of mine called Oleo did um, in the Bahamas, NASA, and it's, it's underneath a hotel, and the premise of it is that in uh, excavating this hotel, they accidentally came upon the lost city of Atlantis, which in their scenario was half submerged and half not submerged. And, these are, and they invented an entire culture, an entire set of technologies having to do with a culture that was slowly going underwater. So they invented these prehistoric, you know, er, you know, ancient diving suits, and this is the real space behind. In the back, you see is in the largest enclosed aquarium um, in the world, I believe. Although someone just told me that there's just been a bigger one made. But this is the mythology. So they're sort of borrowing from the tradition of ancient narrative environments and creating their own new fictional story. And you can see that half the city is submerged under the water. There's an underwater scene with the bullhead. And then this is from Riven, the computer game. <laughs> and this is really how I came to this, was by looking at virtual reality narratives and, and realizing how most of them are pretty boring. And how, how we could go back into real architecture and find some much more interesting narrative genres. But this uses a lot of classic narrative architecture forms. And you just see, I mean, this is just a few sample images, but there's this all these different bits and pieces all around that you explore. Again, there's a backstory that's preformed, but you unearth it in whatever order that you like. And there's another image. I was showing this to the visual communication class um, last week because I love how this is completely bizarre, but you can tell it's a vehicle, even though it's totally alien and weird. So you asked for it. 